Hi, can you hear me clearly and see me? Yes, sir. No. It's clear? Yes, sir. Are we starting at 10 30? And who is moderating it?
Hello, am I audible? Yeah, Purvasha, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Good morning, Dr. Good morning. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. You've tried your screen share? I think I should because I'm first. Shall I try? Yeah, please do. Is it visible? Yes, it is. Okay. You have Should any animations or anything that also you Sorry? Do you have any animations or recordings you can test that too? No, I don't. Okay. No, no. So just check if the slides are moving. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Right. So. Well, are we starting at 10 30? Uh, is that John? So, uh, uh, Dr. Arpan, I will also try my share screen. Yeah, I'll stop it. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, we can see full screen. Yeah. yeah okay. okay. And I can go one or, one or two ahead. Yeah. I'm just checking yeah, my videos. Oh, yeah. It's working. It's working. Good. Is that the only video? Or? No, there are. It's basically video based. Okay. No, they're working. One's working. Yeah. Good morning, Dr. John. Or, I'm sorry, I don't know a few people here. It's working. Yeah. Urvasha, it's fine. Yeah, I'll just stop sharing. Yeah. Just checking if the mic is working. Am I audible? Yeah, perfectly. You're very audible. Uh, sir, I think you must be muted, sir. No, I'm not no, muted. Actually, I think I think it's my my speaker which is not working. Okay. Can Purvasha hear me? Yes, yes. sir. I am audible. Oh, yeah. Okay. So is my uh, DOS 2020 up uh, the reverse? It's correct. It's like oh. mine. Okay. Both us. Both yeah. This appears uh, inverted here. I'm sorry, John. I oh. don't know you. I don't know you. Can you just... Uh, sir, I am I'm Dr. John Davis Akhtar from John. Kerala. From Ooh. Kerala. Nice. Uh, I'm a glaucoma consultant. I did my UGPG from Jipmer Pondicherry and uh, okay. glaucoma fellowship from Arvind Pondicherry. So be ready to learn some pathology and microbiology. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, good morning, sir. Good morning, Dr. Poo. Good morning, Dr. Lal. Hi. How are you? Good morning, Akita. How are you? Lovely. I'm good. How are you? We can see your curtains from behind. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, <laughs> upload my, uh, the virtual background. Maybe I should do that. Might look a little better. If you have time, you can, yeah. Yeah, I actually have a simultaneous session in the other hall. So oh. my talk is last. So I think I'll, I'm a judge in that session. I'll probably do that and then come back for my uh, talk uh, as, as I'm the last speaker in any case. So I think that should be okay. Uh, you want me to ping you? Yeah, that would be great. But I have I have logged in simultaneously from two different devices so that I know what's going on. Ultimate technology. You're busy you virtually too. <laughs> you won't listen to my talk, Dr. Lal. You should leave after my talk. Definitely. I'll do that. So I'll be logged in. Don't worry. I, I need, I'd I love need to, to learn I some need, microbiology I need and to, I need to bore you a little bit. <laughs> Not at all, sir. It's always interesting. <laughs> I, have, I, have bored, I have bored in Purvasha enough for two, three years you now. Want new, new people to... <laughs> <laughs> new, 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 new scapegoats. <laughs> so you'll be doing... The virtual thing is very tough to do. I think you will be doing simultaneous bilateral uh, webinar. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, both my sessions are at the same time. <laughs> you sound, you make it sound like bilateral ophthalmology. Or something. <laughs> Precisely. So, do we start in two minutes? Do I mute myself? Uh, we'll... I think uh, Kishan, Kishan is uh, managing events here. Is it? Can you tell us uh, when do we go live?
Anybody from the event side, can you tell us when we will go live? It's a live. It's live, I think. Yes, no, it's a live. Good morning, Dr. Shantanu. Dr. Gandhi here. You're muted. You can't hear you. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. So, uh, Dr. John, we can start in a minute, I think, because there are people... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I think, Dr. Arpan, you can share your screen. Visible? Yes. So tell me when to start or whatever. If anyone is logged into the website, uh, can you see if we are live yet? It says live on the top thing it is. Uh, they have to connect it and activate the okay. live parts. Okay. Shall we start, Dr. John? Uh, yeah, I'm not able to find Hall G on my login, uh, but I suppose they might be live. If we can get a confirmation, we can start. So. Anybody else has a confirmation whether we are live? Okay. Uh, Dr. Arpan, he says we are live, so you can start. Okay, great. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. John. Uh, good morning, everybody. A virtual good morning. And uh, my topic is the scope of ocular pathology and microbiology laboratory services and its impact on clinical management. So we are a huge country with a big population and we don't have as many ocular pathologists and microbiologists. So it's an exciting time for me to talk a little bit about our work and how we can help standalone ophthalmologists, institutes and hospitals in this area and collaborate and work together towards patient management. So the scope that the, our lab or a lab, ocular lab has usually is histopathology, cytology, microbiology, molecular hematology, biochemistry, immunology, and genetic. I'll be covering the first two. So uh, a, uh, a little picture, a pictorial description of what all we see and what where an impact could be. So whether it's a bacterial, fungal, or a viral, microbiology has a role. These are few corneal ulcers with representative pictures of histopathology on the right and on the, on the extreme left is a microsporodial. So all kind of patients, from, uh, patients, farmers, depending on which area you are and different presentations. These are a few pictures now which are under the microscope and, and, the, way, and the variation in each one of them is fascinating. Whether it's a fungal or a nocardia, 
or fusarium or a candida aspergillus we get a fair number of bacterial infections in fact about 60% of our infections are bacterial and then about 30 are fungal so a clinical picture with what we see under the microscope as a lab person i always insist on a clinical picture and speaking to the clinician it's a very good idea for the lab head to speak to the clinician and the clinician to speak because it always works better if you have a clinical pathological or clinical microbiology correlation because eventually it's for patient management we've been getting fair amount of microsporidian in october and november and these are a few pictures of them fascinating part is the viral keratitis and at a lab we offer gemza staining so if there's somebody who can read out a good gemza stain then you can actually pick up cytopathic changes under the microscope whether it is ballooning or enlargement and then if you have pcr facilities like we do you can simultaneously do an hsv cmv tb adenovirus pan bacterial we we get fair number of samples from centers for hsv and cmv and tb and the samples are in a you know red container which has phosphate phosphate buffered saline so whether it's corneal scraping or ac tap vitreous tap or tear samples we derive the dna content and do the test from it uh, we are also get to see cases of nocardia and a fair number of acanthomoebas too something which has fascinated us over the last one year and in fact six cases we have recently reported has been the pythium so it requires a keen eye not only clinically but also at the lab whether you are identifying a flat colony which looks very different from a fungal or you are looking at a aseptic fungal hyphae or you are looking at a sodium iodide h2so4 on tissue sections you do require training on pythium and you do require a lot of collaboration to be looking at pythium this is something that has caught our eye over one year and as i said we all should be aware of what we are dealing we in fact have been getting cases of referral cases which have also shown up to be pythium so what's the role of a lab in, in a far flung secondary center or a stand alone hospital you do a koh grams and basically you get to a diagnosis and then you can probably send the culture samples to a good center which can report it out it's not only you don't really require something but a good collaboration where you can actually train technicians allied ophthalmologic personnel and optometrists to do your staining and your culturing these are all pictures that we have had growth from people we've actually trained the extreme important part in our branch is pre analysis anything that goes in the processes before the sample or the plates reach us so ice packing controlled temperatures are absolutely mandatory we all know from different parts of the country we have temperature swings we have we have different environment variations so in order to keep it as pre analytically perfect we must have a very well controlled temperature thing these are few pictures on how a sample or a culture plate should ideally be coming in and then eventually a growth coming in the scraping set should have three slides three solid media two liquid media there are times we just get two slides but it's a great idea to have a third slide if your, if your material is enough you can do a gemza you can do an afb stain and you can i mean you can always de stain a gram stain but if you have a third slide there's always that much more you can report on and two solid media at least should be there if not three and liquid media to pick up different organisms we've trained ophthalmologists 
we have trained skilled and trained paramedics and sometimes the, the documentation and the learning from them has been also phenomenal i go on to ocular histopathology and cytopathology we get a variant variant different tissues different pathologies i'll just run you through few of our pictures and pathologies that we get this is the choroidal melanoma invasive squamous cell carcinomas these are 40x pictures sebaceous gland carcinomas nodular basal cell carcinomas biopsy is coming in 10% formalin with proper histories with a proper requisition form are mandatory wherever possible a clinical picture could be shared but definitely as it's a medical legal document a very proper histopathology requisition form needs to be filled it could be on an email it could be sent on a hard copy but it needs to accompany every histopathology form or every histopathology biopsy that's the pre analytical part of ocular histopathology we don't see too many of neva uh, nevis uh, but this is one of the pictures the common tumors that we see are retinoblastoma some of them very advanced on the left is a full mount view of a slide and then it's a 40x view of the retinoblastoma cells we also get to see sebaceous gland carcinoma squamous cell carcinoma lymphoma and a fair amount of ossns for ossns we do cyto for imprint cytologies gemsas as well as biopsies these are three ways we tackle an ossn pathology this is a presentation which we publish on a molluscum nearly every day we get uh, six, seven corneal button histologies and they are extremely interesting because they could actually tell you where the fungus is what the extent is where the location is corneal dystrophies from particular bells which you can actually use for not only for corneal tissues but you could take in blood samples and use it for uh, later studies like genetic studies these are two corneal past stains as well as alcyon blue demonstrating the deposits a few other cases that we have we see and ocular histopathology does see is cystic sarcosis dermoid and of course in a country like ours granulomatous lesion with tuberculosis must on a biopsy do a zn stain and not wait for the clinician to get back to you and ask you to rule out tuberculosis so it should not be just left as a we see many reports where they just write granulomas but what could be the cause is extremely important we had a re recent publication of a mascara and a lacrimal gland cytology is the other part of ocular histopathology in cytology fine needle aspirates bone marrow fluid cytology csf vitreous and as i touched briefly upon impression and imprint cytology so the role basic micropathology has a huge role all of us know koh grams and cultures are extremely important and a tool in preventing corneal blindness early detection correct medication are extremely important ocular histopathology has its own role with the correct tissue diagnosis with prognostication and grading we've learned to use the digital platform when you get in biopsies from as far as 400 500 kilometers or you get to read out a koh or grams on a digital platform something that we have been working on is demodex and all of us do see cases of blepharitis vkcs and it's pretty fascinating how demodex has also been catching all our eyes i'm sure in different practices these are a few pictures of the demodex digital pathology has uh, we've learned digital pathology thanks to the covid times sitting here we can read out slides and different pictures either if it, if the person across there has sent you a whatsapp picture or someone who has a microscope with a camera the role of digital pathology and microbiology is extremely high even if you do not have somebody who has an ocular lab or a microbiologist right next to you you always have a smartphone with you send in pictures to a person you think who can who can report or who can tell you and then that person can always teach you uh, and by the time you see your next case you know that this could be probably a cause i now know of a lot of ophthalmologists who, who actually help me also read out and, and understand along with the process so it's a learning two way process 
it can be done through team viewer any desk there are many platforms to share it all of us have smartphones whatsapp images emails is a good way to share it and a second opinion platform for digital pathology is extremely important bio repositories are deep freezers where you can actually put in samples for amniotic cell membranes tissue samples and which can be used later for future genetic studies or other studies or research purposes so just a suggestion i would like a, the dos platform to at least have ocular clinical microbiology and histopathology readouts every 3 months where there is stress on clinical and microbiology cases more more maybe at least a talk on digital pathology platform and multi center studies and an opportunity to, to reach out to more ocular pathologists and microbiologists all over the world and also to collaborate with different ophthalmologists so that they can also start at least basic lab services with them and we all move towards a, a better diagnostic module and of course a great opportunity to publish together thank you so much i'd be happy to take any questions or comments so dr gandhi that is very well presented thank you sir and uh, of course uh, with the covid times i think the microbiologist is closer to us now through the virtual platform yes definitely yes it should be i think we should all get closer with with opportunity and learning and help each other yeah so these times have taught us to you know different things as well so yes uh, i think any questions we can take or uh, we can go on to the next presentation then so maybe we can take questions in the end if if this yeah i hope i stuck to my time uh, very well okay spot on you. spot on thank you <laughs> because i i i had 68 slides and i didn't want to tell you that before <laughs> no i i mean but we were keeping track we were keeping track okay thank you Well Over to the next speaker. Th thank you, Dr. Shant. Thank you. So, uh, who's our next speaker? Uh, uh, Dr. Kirti Singh, uh, if she is around. Dr. Kirti, I do I don't see her here. Yeah. So maybe Dr. Amar Pujari can go next. Yes, I will present. Yeah, Dr. Amar, please. Yes. is my slide visible sir yes your slides are visible yes thank you and your thank you audience. shantanu sir and all my colleagues uh, today i will be presenting on smartphone imaging in ophthalmology i do not have any financial interest in any of the uh, smartphone devices or the any of the technical things described here so why there is a need for comprehensive uh, innovation in ophthalmology because the existing imaging tools are either expensive or non portable so we have to think of a solution which are going to be a low cost portable and reliable tool to document as well as image various findings in glaucoma as well as general ophthalmology so in this direction we have done some of the innovations which i want to present here so this is the first innovation on the left side you can see a small uh, clippable lens which is called as macro lens which has a 10x magnifying capacity so you can clip that uh, lens onto any smartphone okay after that you can capture the anti segment pictures using either smartphone light or using a slit lamp light even the uh, thin or the bright light or even the cobalt blue filter similarly if you interpose a 90 degree in between this macro lens clipped smartphone and the eye then you can capture the disc or the macular pictures on the right side you can see if you take the pictures from a temporal 15 degree angulation you can uh, take pictures in such a way that you can identify the posterior surface the icl and the anterior capsule in one picture so then you can transfer these images onto images software and you can quantify the icl vault in the left bottom you can see we have captured the images two iris images with the protractor in this condition in cases where there is a pro probably palsy is there when there is infrablic overaction is there when you want to in strabismus particularly when you want to quantify the torsional changes so you can capture the pictures pre operatively and subsequently post operatively you can again capture the pictures and you can 
filter is a single iris script and you can quantify what is the exact change in the iris structure. Similarly, you can apply the same principle here in tolic eye surgeries. Post operatively on day one, you can capture and you can quantify at what location the eye hole has been situated. Similarly, you can quantify the enter chamber depth as I described above for ICL valve. So with these are our like previous editions, uh, innovations. In addition to this one, uh, we wanted to show something new. So for this one, we consider iPhone 10 and the 11 phones because these have different uh, camera qualities. On the upper image, you can see that is the iPhone 10, which has a very uh, short distance between the camera and the uh, light source, which is around six millimeter. On the lower side, you can see that is the iPhone 11 camera, even though that is not acting as a coaxial, but it has better resolution. So this is the first observation when using iPhone 10, we are going to switch on the video mode and we are going to turn on the light. So slowly you can take towards the patient who has been intubated. It's a kid, pediatric glaucoma patient. Then you can uh, image the disc as well as the peripapillary. You can increase it to 2x and to, to quantify or to image the optic disc in a much higher magnification. Similarly, in your OPDs, you can use the iPhone 10 and you can turn on the video mode with the continuous light source on. You can quantify or you can image the disc peripapillary as well as macular findings. The third thing, you can take multiple videos of the posterior pole using iPhone 10 with the video mode and you can acquire subsequent screenshots from those videos and by combining these videos or by making a collage on uh, Adobe Photoshop, you can get pictures like red cam pictures, wide angle pictures. This is very useful in ROP patients and retinoblastoma patients where peripheral setting do not have uh, expensive red cam setup, they can use this phone. The fourth observation, as we know, uh, Dr. Sihot et al. described something called as Van Eric plus grading system for inferior angle. Similarly, similar to that technique, we can project three mm of slit light onto the inferior angle that is around six o'clock position, 1.5 mm onto the cornea, 1.5 mm onto the sclera, and we can acquire the magnified pictures of the inferior angle. After acquiring these images, we can transfer these images onto image software and using an angulation tool, we can quantify what is the angle open in this patient. On the left side, it's a narrow angle and right side, it's a wide angle. So we compared with the ASOCT and like the uh, amount of correlation was within two degrees on either side. Similarly, we can quantify the actual angle findings. In this left picture, you can see we are positioning the gonioscope onto the patient eye and we are going to project a thin slit from the slit lamp. And right side, myself holding a iPhone 11 with a macro lens clipped onto it. So we can slowly advance it towards the patient eye and we can capture the angle findings. But some people were of the opinion that we do not use slit lamp in peripheral setups where there is no, no uh, availability of slit lamp. In those conditions, we need to describe something else. So after positioning the patient against the wall, you can, uh, put, uh, you can project a diet of streak light onto the gonioscope. And the second person who has iPhone 11 or any other good quality camera, after clipping the magnifying lens, slowly you can take the phone towards the gonioscope and you can actually document what are the findings in the angle. So these are other angle findings, angle recession, and then how to identify the detailed angle structures. So in conclusion, newer smartphones can be used to image a majority of the anterior segment as well as posterior con uh, segment conditions in adult as well as pediatric patients. So this is our recent review in Graphase Ophthalmology. You can read this one. And these are our other publications. Thank you. Good, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, sorry, I was late. Thanks, Dr. Shantanu, for taking care. I was stuck in other uh, stuck to me. I was uh, chairing another session, so I just joined right now. So I think before I take on my talk, can we have uh, this is any right now? We have the lecture on NABH Boone or Bain, Dr. Saurabh. Is he there? Is Dr. Saurabh there? Dr. Shantanu, is Dr. Saurabh there? No, I don't think, ma'am. He's not on board as of okay, now. Okay, so we've done, you've, uh, you've done Dr. Arpan and Dr. Puj Amar Pujari, correct? Two yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, two talks are with this. So, two so talks we finished. Next one is wet lab models, different ways to learn surgery. Dr. Purvasha? Yes, ma'am. Is ma she there? Ma okay, yes. you can take on and then if, if, if it's okay, then I'll do my lecture after this. Sure, ma'am. Sure. Thank you. Dr. Purvasha, please. <laughs> She's going to talk about... 
wet lab models, different ways to learn surgeries. And I hope you all know that National Medical Council has made wet labs compulsory before giving accreditation to any college or institution. The NB already had, but you have to, it's mandatory to have a wet lab. So please, Dr. Purvasha. Yeah. Right. Good morning, everyone. And today, uh, I would like to thank DOS for giving me this opportunity to share our wet lab models in ophthalmic surgery, which we have been helping to learn and teach at our center here at LGI Institute, Ambala. So uh, being an accomplished surgeon is basically everybody's goal uh, of any ophthalmologist. And majority of this can be possible. However, there are certain hindrances in this journey, which can be easily overcome by simulation-based training using wet labs and artificial simulators. So uh, a, a good uh, wet lab model should be able to give you the exact feel, uh, the closest feel of the tissue, as well as be simple and easy to use. So uh, I will be discussing here a few of our wet lab models and uh, which we try to simplify the complex surgeries. Let's start with something like DMEC or the uh, Desmes membrane endothelial keratoplasty, wherein all the tissues which are, uh, we need to be understanding the dealing of the Desmase membrane orientation as well as handling outside the chamber as well as inside the anterior chamber. So if we look at the uh, actual surgery, we need to be very careful and we need to understand how to handle the DM so that we have a good outcome in uh, the actual patient when we are operating. So we recently published this simulation model for DMEC uh, preparation, donor preparation. And this is using the very humble allium sepa or the commonly used onion. So the onion can be refined in a partial thickness, uh, using a partial thickness refine, and then we can stain it with tripen blue. It peels almost like the human tissue. It can be stained very well, exactly. And then it is used for peeling, it is used for uh, it can be used to help in punching and then stamping the DM just like in the real tissue. So this is one model that we have used. It gives a scroll also almost similar to the human tissue. So this can be then pushed into the injector and can be used in an artificial uh, practice eye to learn the other maneuvers. Another uh, uh, simulation that we have used is a big uh, glass syringe with the bevel just simulating the injector and this is a plastic sheet on which one side has been marked as the endothelium and the other as the stroma marked with the p sign and this is to teach the correct orientation with bevel down what happens when the dm endothelial complex is inserted into the anterior chamber it opens with the stromal side up and the correct orientation of the p mark however if we inject it in the other side or the reverse orientation, the endothelial side will open towards the host side. The other model that we have developed is the DMAC wet lab model wherein an artificial anterior chamber has been used and a piece of rubber glove, the latex rubber, rubber glove is used and a discarded human corneal tissue is used to understand all the maneuvers of the DM inside the anterior chamber. So this can be used to understand the uh, different uh, maneuvers inside. Also, the skill set is used is is needed to understand the fluid dynamics of DM inside the anterior chamber. And for this, we have devised the DMEC aquarium, wherein there is a plastic filled balloon in which we can easily maneuver. And uh, uh, there is a plastic uh, sheet marked P, and this is used to understand the fluid dynamics of the scroll inside the eye. So this can be used for uh, understanding how the DM folds, unfolds, how it can be reversed, how it can be moved and centered. And then finally, air can be injected. 
So the various movements of pinning, the wave creation, the ripple formation can all be understood using this. Another surgery that we have uh, taught using the, um, the models is the iris claw lens model, wherein the goat's eye has been mounted on a stand and using very simple uh, tools like the aisle holding forcep and the enclavation cannula, we have uh, uh, been able to make uh, the general ophthalmologists very, uh, uh, you know, adept with the surgery. This is the goat eye model. It has, a, it, it can be a very good idea to uh, learn through this. This is the iris claw lens, which has been put and how to orient it, how to hold it. And all these maneuvers can be learned using the goat eye. So the, here, the thing to understand is that uh, the process of stabilization of the IOL and the enclavation is the main part. And this, this model gives that feel really well. And if you see the vertically elongated oval pupil uh, can, be, uh, can be used, the proximal part of this goat's eye can be used to mimic the human pupil. So the dimpling is seen at the end of the surgery and a nicely enclavated model is here. Another surgery, uh, which we have uh, tried to master is the lid margin mucous membrane graft model. This is using the pig head. So this can be uh, used to understand the lid dissection as well as the oral mucosal graft dissection as well as the graft suturing. So all these can be actually learned using the pig's head goat uh, pig's head model. And see if you can see there is the oral mucosal graft harvesting going on and then the graft can be thinned out. It mimics the real time uh, graft of uh, human tissue and then it can be sutured onto the um, simulator. Next is the Ahmed glaucoma valve, which can be also learned how we can, uh, how we can learn how to implant this. A very uh, interesting uh, tissue here. And this is on the goat's eye model and the conjunctival pocket is being created. The tenon is being separated. Now the, uh, the amethyst glaucoma valve is being primed. It can be placed easily into the pocket created. It can be sutured and anchored into place. And then the, uh, the, you, we can learn the actual insertion of the tube and its placement and how to um, stabilize it and anchor it with sutures. We can even place a scleral graft and practice how to stabilize that and anchor that using sutures. And then finally create the conjunctival closure and the blend. So basically, all these models help to shorten the learning curve and help us to master our surgeries when we are act before we actually go ahead and do it on the human model, human eyes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> that was very interesting. And we have also devised a wet lab model in our hospital. And these tissue get, get tissues assessments were very, very innovative. Thank you so much. Uh, with, with the permission of my co-chairman, can I start my slides, Dr. Shantanu? Ma'am, please, most welcome, yes. ma'am. We are waiting Thank for you. you. Thank you. Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Not in full screen yet. Yeah, I'm just going to full screen. Yes, ma'am. All right. So thank you to DOS for having this subject, which is very close to my heart. So doctor is a second God on earth. Ha ha. No longer true. No longer true. In fact, the reverse. A lot of us are subjected to violence, especially our students, because they are very vulnerable. This shifting equation and deteriorating doctor-patient relationship is because the patients need and demand to know the instant cure required and their immense access to information makes the doctor vulnerable. So the question asked is, how can you prevent this violence? And the answer, which I think is in listening, active listening and communication to patients. That is the talisman which I've been working on with my students for the last three, four years, and I believe it is effective. Therefore, the need for this talk 
and I have no financial interests. And this has been perceived all over the nation. And MCI now, NMC, has come up with the ATCOM model, which focuses on communication as the key attribute to a medical doctor. And this has been echoed again by the ophthalmology, ophthalmology, ophthalmology doctors, where professionalism, ethics, and communication has been taken up as a must-know skill. Now, before doing anything, we have to know what ingredients we learn, what ingredients we must have to have proper communication. The first ingredient is compassion. Compassion is when you're confronted with others, another suffering, you feel motivated to relieve that suffering. And no better than Tara Zameen pay picture to tell you what compassion is. And please remember as scientists, whenever we do an act of compassion, researchers have found out that oxytocin or the bonding hormone is secreted and a feeling of pleasure lights up. So it's a win-win situation. The second very important ingredient, which I tell my students, resilience. It's a very famous Pulitzer Prize winning picture of a malnourished girl struggling to reach a UN feeding center and a vulture waiting for that child to die. And this person who took the picture when he published it, he won the award, but a comment that the man adjusting his lens to take just the right frame might just be another predator was his undoing. And this gentleman, Kevin Carter, committed suicide. Why did this happen? Because he had over much of compassion, over much of sympathy. So the key ingredient, which third one, which must be there is empathy. Empathy is professional detached concern. Understanding the patient's perspective Please remember, this becomes an entirely cognitive behavior. There's an emotional overlay to it, but it's a cognitive behavior and entirely learnable. Unlike sympathy, which is purely emotional and has negative consequences of emotional transference and vicarious trauma. The fourth ingredient is tender, loving care towards yourself, because as doctors, we must read so much. We must keep reinventing as surgeons. Right now, we are trying to do a virtual conference. We don't know how to do. Why, why is that important? That TLC, because compassion fatigue or burnout is very common. Our corona warriors are going through it right now. You have to have a catharsis. You have to forgive, first of all, yourself and others because you are not robots. You are not perfect. Remember this picture, which is shown to you in every flight. If there's an oxygen decrease, require oxygen reduction, first of all, put the mask for yourself and then for your child. So that's as doctors, we must understand that safeguard ourselves. So having told about the ingredients, let me talk about the effective communication. Verbal communication, we're all doing it. Nonverbal communication, we're all doing it. Visual, we're all doing it. So let's see the role of each. Verbal, there are barriers. Language, the media, nonverbal, it transcends all barriers. Visual communication is the ultimate, as this picture will tell you. This picture of this child in a, in a chalk diagram doesn't need to tell you what she's feeling. Last comes the methods, how should we communicate? Nonverbal language, 55% is body language, and that's the relevance of emoticons in WhatsApp messages also because body language or nonverbal language is more important. Like this image is showing you, it tells you, it's very powerful image of, it's telling you what the child is perceiving, okay? There's a need to be shown. Facial gestures, eye contact, touch, silence, hand gestures, and this new one, which is coined as fubbing, this new word has come up in the dictionary where ignoring one's companion in order to pay attention to one's phone or mobile devices is termed as fubbing. Social distance has come up in the pandemic right now, okay? But it is known beforehand, and that word is proxenemics, that there should be four levels of social distance. And for with patients and students, you have personal distance to social distance. Never have a close distance with patients that will not safeguard yourself and you will not be taken seriously. How to greet a patient? Again, look at the gender aspect. If you are a gentleman and you're greeting a lady or the reverse, these 
hand gestures or the hand contact is very important. It gives a patient a feeling of connect. When I gave my FRCS exam, I was told that your retina patients will come with the guide dog. You have to understand to greet the dog first. So I was taught to do a handshake with the dog because that's very important. Otherwise, the dog will not allow you to touch the patient. And these Boy Scouts always do a left handshake because the tribal um, African warrior taught them that for doing a left handshake, we must show, we are going to show our trust because we let down a spear. So seeing where you are, depending on you're in America, India, namaste or bowing, you have to have the gesture. Gender aspect, take care of. Choose your right role models because what I am speaking and what I am doing are two different things. And if we are choosing role models who speak something and do something else, our communication will never be effective. Have realistic expectations. We are the generation of instant gratification, instant coffee, but these soft skills are not having instant results. Last, a lot of ophthalmologists are ladies now. In fact, 50% are ladies now and 50% are gentlemen. Please remember that as ophthalmic surgeons, we have gender different roles because we have been, as girls, we've been taught nurturing and caring from our childhood. As boys, you've been taught that crying is a sign of weakness. But please remember, crying is not a problem. And if you are showing some emotional connect with your patients, the sky also has tears. Last, choose your environs or peer group for having effective communication because in that environment, you can bloom or you can perish. Thank you. So after, after that, can I have the next speaker? That would be Dr. Sneha Agarwal is there. Yeah, ma'am. Good morning. I'm there. So Dr. Sneha, you are talking on refraction, uh, refraction techniques and prescription pearls. Dr. Sneha. Uh, good morning, everyone. Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, I would like to thank DOS and I would like to say that I am not a doctor, I am optometrist. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. So I would be talking about refraction techniques uh, and prescription pearls. So uh, I'm not able to move my slides. Just click on the screen once and then try. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So uh, basically we all know that what are the prerequisites for the refraction basically. And so it's, you know, the refraction is must uh, uh, valuable for infants, deaf, malingerous, ma mentally challenged and uh, where the causes of reduced visual acuity is unknown. And uh, what are the basics of refraction to get the correct, you know, uh, refractive error or value. So the eye should be accommodation relaxed state. There should be maximum uh, plus or minimum minus uh, the optimal correction. And we must consider the vortex uh, distance and uh, for high prescription individuals. Uh, so uh, an IPD adjustment is also of uh, very much significance. We all know about what is objective and subjective refraction. Objective refraction is mainly done by retinoscopy or or to re refractometry, keratometry, or electrophysiological test. In subjective ref refraction, we seek the patient's response. So uh, what are the observations and inferences? Uh, this you know, uh, plays a very important role uh, if we do our retinoscopy in a correct manner. And what are our inferences uh, depends, uh, affect our results. So if there is no movement, uh, the eye is myopic with movement, the eye Can be emetropic, myopic, or hypermetropic. If there is against moment, the actually myopic. Brightness refractive error. The degree of refractive error. Basically. 
So bright and fast shadow shows not reflex. If uh, in horizontal and vertical reflex, no astigmatism, or if there is oblique orientation, or if there is unequal orientation, then it is astigmatism. Uh, we all know the drugs uh, which are used in pediatric and adult refraction, and we should uh, we must know the amount of dosage, this uh, evaluation of subjective test, and uh, where we should use. So uh, atropine sulfate. Uh, we ointment we most commonly use that I have seen, you know, um, a lot of practitioners skipping the writing ointment or guiding the patients and they come out with the drops, uh, you know, which uh, affect the results also and which affect uh, their systemic evaluation. And we must consider uh, the previous allergies while we are guiding these patients for these specific drugs. Tonus allowance we must consider while we are doing the subjective refraction. So we come to the pearl children overcome those challenges. So challenges dependent on objective techniques and uh, refractive status changes with age. So we must frequently uh, uh, refract uh, children depending upon Fixation must be, it might be short plating intervals and we must be sure about retinoscopy. The binocular, normally they are associated with binocular disorders or uh, like squint or uh, accommodative problems. So we sh should be very sure about this. How we can overcome those challenges? We must have a friendly approach. Accommodation is not active when uh, they are cyclo when we are giving them cycloplegia. We must be quick and retinoscopy bars are very very useful rather than you know uh, uh, placing those lenses um, individually. They should try to retract upper lid if the child is slipping and sedation should be the last option if the child is very incorporative uh, and examination under anesthesia. So not, there is no substitute for retinoscopy because the subjective response might vary and it might not be reliable. Proper correction of refractive error is must because uh, the whole, uh, you know, emetropization process and the correction dip and even the correction of squint depends upon the refraction. We, uh, we must provide clear, comfortable vision with normal binocularity and uh, the prevention of risk of amblyopia is must at this age. So these are the, you know, various tools we can use. So the first is, you know, these are the retinoscopy bars, which comes in plus and minus lenses. Uh, this IPD adjusted frames where we don't have to adjust the uh, IPD main and uh, isometropia. Uh, uh, hypermetropes, they have the risk of developing amblyopia. Full cycloplegic refraction must be given equal accommodation demand. If contact lenses are needed, we must proceed towards it. If fakia cycloplegia is not needed, we must consider this. Madratics can be used. Early prescription prevents amblyopia. We must pre pre uh, prescribe full correction to infants. Uh, near it must be considered and school going. Optimal correction with near addition is must. A good follow-up is also needed. So we have different kinds of reflexes and uh, uh, in opacities or in corneal lens media, dark areas against red background. So in irregular uh, reflex, like in keratoconus, corneal scars, cataracts, opacities, LASIK or RK, these are the few complicated cases where the reflex is very much irregular and we need you know more time to do that. Gray reflex can be seen in retinal detachment cases. And um, so in cases of you know, uh, astigmatism, how do we align the glow? And we must learn that we must, we must swap the, uh, this moment so that we can have, we can align the astigmatism properly. So this is, you know, oblique movement where the moment is moving in a different direction than the retinoscopic moment. So this is astigmatism. We commonly see in um, basically uh, corneal uh, irregularities. So we can't, we are not able to properly identify, you know, this is which direction the glow is moving. So we must consider the 
major movement to which, uh, in cases of keratoconus we have you know swelling reflex so swell so spins around the point apex of the cone uh, also known as oil droplet reflex and it is difficult to attain a neutralization point we can skip dilating the eye because the uh, glow becomes you know more uh, confusing and refining astigmatism access is a challenge because it keeps on changing we might use jcc consider jcc uh, in cases of you know uh, relatively lower or higher astigmatism and uh, ar or km reading can be useful though the ar you know is very very uh, variable and it shows high amounts of astigmatism and myopia but uh, keratometry is very useful to uh, help in evaluating the axis and the amount of astigmatism a good subjective testing is anyways useful uh, in cases of uh, adults uh, hypermetropia basically visual acuity is not a true indicator because the eye might accommodate and uh, so near visual acuity can be evaluated in those cases if the patient is very symptomatic and they normally present late so myopia is very common in myops blurred vision for distance or convergence insufficiency uh, as we correct for uh, the patient for the glasses we must always check the convergence uh, as well and uh, astigmats they normally present late and squeeze eyes tilt their head so uh, our observation should be very good while we are evaluating the patient because a lot can be gained by that and never recommend round frames in cases of astigmat astigmatisms uh, fogging uh, post myopic test is one of the key measures to prevent accommodation maximum power should be put in the back slot of the frame back vertex power should be considered uh, uh, highest power in the back slot and maximum plus in cases of hyperops and minimum minus and duochrome must be carried out we must take care while we are writing the prescription and we must guide patient and hyperops takes time to adjust uh, to their acceptance so we should we always wait uh, how do we refine vision jackson cross cylinder astigmatic fan so i frequently use jackson cross cylinder it is a very very useful tool in determining the uh, axis of the astigmatism and the amount of astigmatism duochrome uh, all is wonderful uh, in you know refining the sphere uh, for the plus and minus and worth for dot test so we always cross check uh, these things uh, in cases of elderly patients age related hypermetropia is very common so in nuclear sclerosis there is a myopic shift cortical sclerosis there is a hyperopic shift and uh, we must change and as the age uh, the astigmatism is also changing to the against the rule astigmatism so we must consider all these uh, factors and a clinical correlation is useful while we are refracting uh, the patient there is dull reflex in small pupils so uh, the dim light can be uh, we can have a dim light if we don't want to dilate the patient so power of glasses can be the best starting point if we if the patient is using we prefer a dark room and subjective response uh, they they might respond late elderly patients because they might take some time to read and a profession uh, should be asked to have the near addition in hobbies and as per their uh, vocational or professional needs near addition the type of addition should be prescribed uh, in cases of albinism basically they present late and uh, they normally present to low vision services and they are very very photophobic so if we don't have the low vision services even the simplest you know uh, prescriptions can be very useful uh, like a proper refraction and the prescription of photochromatic or dark gray tinted glasses giving caps or hats so that you know by the time they are uh, attained by the low vision uh, you know consultants or professionals they can be very very useful uh, nystagmus we should always use a spinsman occluder the most beneficial we must not block the form well, the light sense the light sense should be given uh, to block the form sense and high hyperopic or positive lenses can be used if we don't have the spinsman occluder and we should recognize the null point uh, by trying the retinoscopy in cases of subluxated iols you know uh, uh, the, the loss of accommodation is there and refractive error we must evaluate in both um, the cases Uh, in the aphakic zone and the phakic zone as well, and we must consider through which zone the patient is mainly seeing. Uh, dilated and undilated refraction can vary, but we must consider the patient in the undilated state, and we must, uh, uh, you know, given give the correction accordingly. If the patient is reading via aphakic zone, um, we must give the uh, near addition as well. 
in cases of congenital cataract it depends upon the location visual acuity might improve if away from visual axis early intervention is preferred may lead to amblyopia or strabismus traumatic cataract uh, normally associated with injuries and scars km reading can be very helpful in these cases nuclear cataract uh, retinoscopy might vary uh, we can uh, myopic glow more uh, you know towards central than the periphery there are two glows seen uh, mainly so we must uh, uh, make out the difference between the central and the peripheral glow and avoid dilatation in dense cataracts because it might lead to glare and the patient's visual acuity might uh, uh, decrease patient might improve to good visual acuity uh, uh, if we try out myopic correction tint can be helpful yellow tint inside and uh, gray tint outdoors can be helpful if the patient is not willing for surgery or if we are uh, you know wanting to delay the surgery in cases of cortical cataract uh, uh, basically the spots are there so dilatation can be useful to have the retinoscopic glow but not not very useful for the patient prospect and uh, there is a good central glow it's confusing so we must focus towards parents can be done in the dry state improves the vision and reduce glare they, they might show increase in uh, near addition cat uh, basically develops in central area difficult to see glow in uh, dry state so dilatation is preferred in these cases ar can be uh, might mislead it is not useful uh, it might show erroneous previous glasses can be useful near vision might not improve in these cases disorders of cornea you know uh, it, cornea gets scary or uh, scarred or the, the loss of transparency it stops the scatters light from passing through the cornea so refraction uh, is very challenging in these cases dilated retinoscopy is very useful as the pupil gets dilated and the reflex might not might be you know sometimes might be clear keratometry can be very very useful corneal topography is of great value it gives uh, about, it gives an idea about the uh, uh, cylinder and axis multiple pinhole can be used rather than so using yeah, you a, need to you need to wind up if your session has been over and again it's 4 minutes oh sure ma'am so uh, in cases of these you know in cases of high refractive errors as the glow is uh, very dull we must try different lenses and uh, pupil size is uh, of very much significance if we should use the dimmest beam possible uh, basically uh, the challenge is uh, if we are not at the right position in correct working distance head blocking or off axis we might get erroneous readings so and we should uh, appropriate the patient fog uh, appropriately uh, along with refraction prescription quality matters so we can consider high index lenses aspheric lenses anti reflection coat fiber lenses of photochromatic lenses uh, final retinoscopy uh, should be considered and especially for kids we should give oval frames fiber lenses with the rubber bands and uh, d bifocals or executive bifocals depending upon the type type of squint uh, thank you for the patience and uh, uh, sorry for exceeding the time thank you thank you dr sneha your topic was very broad so refraction is something which is has been a bit annoyed and that's so essential for us to learn because that's one of the most common patients i mean ubiquitous patients to come so can we have thank you so much can we have dr john davis who will be talking on the yes, specs john yes, you are in Ar you are still in uh, arvind uh, no ma'am uh, right now i am in ramachandra medical college chennai okay okay dr john please carry on okay ma'am um is my screen visible Yes, visible. Very well. Okay. Okay. So, Specs. Uh, it is an acronym for Smartphone Portable Eye Clinic System. As Dr. Ramar Pujari had already covered, you can have lots of things with smartphones in ophthalmology. So, let me just go over what can be done with Specs. That is Smartphone Portable Eye Clinic System. So, I put together a bag which contains all these uh, things which you can carry around as a portable eye clinic system. It is a set of do it yourself smartphone based and portable devices for eye doctors on the go so this can be very useful for camps but not only that let's first look at an unboxing so what is inside this we have two smartphones because smartphone is the base of everything there's a tablet pc 
there is an i ruler so that is uh, for measurements there is a 70 adapter a 20 adapter lens there is a red loop anaglyph glasses this is a slit lamp adapter this is a mini topographer which i made then there's a virtual reality headset and uh, this is uh, a plastic bottle uh, fundus camera and a portable slit lamp which i made so i will go through these things this is a typical workflow of a regular eye clinic that is you have history examination and all the different uh, advanced examinations uh, for history taking itself there are special apps now especially with uh, covid even if the patient is in the same hospital you might want to maintain social distancing by using uh, a video conferencing app this particular app allows you to do video conferencing from phone to phone without internet it just directly connects from phone to phone then this uh, set of apps that is i know tamil i know bangla these are made by myself out of a necessity where i was in arbindai hospital and i had to know tamil and i found several of my colleagues uh, who had no clue about tamil i was uh, i was lucky because i knew malayalam and tamil is very similar to malayalam but those coming from north they found it very difficult and this app will have all the questions and phrases which you would need to talk to the patient in english and tamil so you can search for and speak to the patient the specific phrases you want and uh, then uh, for general examination which is often ignored we can even use the phone's uh, camera and flashlight to check the pulse rate uh, it is not very uh, useful to get oximetry but at least a pulse rate you can get and even there is a breath counter which uses a phone's accelerometer to see the movements and uh, you can also check the anemia that is the pallor of uh, the conjunctiva there is a study which used photographs and graded the pallor and you can use it even for transcutaneous bilirubin measurements so these are all parts of uh, general examination which are often ignored but can be done with a smartphone coming to ophthalmology proper we have the visual acuity chart so the eye chart pro uh, it is a chart which runs on an ipad and an iphone and the iphone acts as a remote control for the vision chart on the ipad and this comes out much cheaper than using the specialized uh, vision charts and this is something which is very portable so we saw already we can have these things in the back and then there is this free android app called peak equity which specializes in rapid vision assessment you just swipe in the direction the uh, patient points and then this allows you to rapidly assess vision especially in a camp setting uh, then even stereo equity can be tested with smartphone apps so you have the red blue anaglyph glasses which cost around 200 rupees and you have this app the random dot uh, test this is very similar to the dno test and this app allows you to grade stereopsis up to 300 arc seconds and uh, we can have more uh, apps also similarly refraction can be done with certain attachments so this is ainetra from mit this is dr Ra ramesh raska professor ramesh raska from mit media labs he is behind several ophthalmic uh, and uh, optics related innovations and uh, this is also based on the same technology using this attachment and using the phone screen as uh, uh, as the image projection you can get the refraction values in uh, including astigmatism uh, then there is the eye roller which is a printed scale which i use uh, you take a photograph with this calibration scale in the background you can measure anything by using the specific app called image meter so this is a free app which is available on the google play store as well as the apple uh, app store you download image meter take a photograph with the scale any sort of scale would do and then once you grade once you mark the uh, the actual scale the calibration you can measure anything including areas using the image meter app for eye position you can use the hirschberg test with the eye turn app for eye tilting, for abnormal head posture, you can use the eye tilt app. And for nine case documentation, you can use a nine case app. 
and this is the uh, slit lamp which i made which is made out of urine uh, sample bottles these are three urine collection sample bottles battery switch uh, an led light from a bike and uh, 78 diaper lens because that was what i found handy and this allows you to get a slit so dr amar pujari would uh, note that uh, uh, he had difficulty in getting a slit this would definitely be useful for him because you can get a slit with just uh, cheaper components and this can be useful for even the gonio photographs which he was talking about so anterior segment photography the van herix plus angle measurements gonioscopy and all sorts of uh, examination can be done with this low cost uh, slit lamp made out of uh, urine sample bottles so this is again a picture of the bottle uh, which i made and uh, this is for fundus examination uh, i suppose this is a topic which has been covered extensively this is a plastic bottle a universal uh, adapter and a phone 20 adapter lens is placed here and you get excellent photographs dr prithvi chandrakant was uh, a friend of mine and he uh, developed this and published it in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. It is very useful. I recommend all postgraduate students to have a bottle and an adapter with you. Then uh, this is another thing which I developed recently in uh, during the COVID lockdown. This is a mini topographer. This is still under construction. So you have the Placido uh, disc inside and again an LED set of LED lights to illuminate it and using that uh, and using some software developed by LBPI Center for Innovation, we can potentially measure the corneal topography. So this is how it is done. I'll also show you how the image looks like. So this is what the image looks like. This is just a paper printed uh, uh, with the circle. So it's just not perfect yet, but this is how the topograph placido topography is done. So you don't get tomography, you get topography. And for visual perimetry, there is a device which uh, we had made earlier, which is using a virtual reality headset, a cheap virtual reality headset, a smartphone inside, and another smartphone connected to control it. And uh, you can do uh, a basic visual perimetry using that. So thank you. This is the kit opened up and unboxed. I hope uh, this will be very useful for all of us. Thank you, ma'am. So, thank you, Dr. John. That was fascinating. A lot of innovations out of the box thinking, and that's what it's really required, especially in the current era. So, this is really amazing. And now we have uh, our experience with the new tattoo, corneal tattoo gun. Dr. Ikeda is there. Dr. Ikeda, are you there? Um, I can see her logged in, but anybody has Dr. Ikeda's number because she's I'm the trying. I'm trying her number. Okay. Yeah, just try her number. Meanwhile, any questions so far for the panelists? We'll be happy to take that before. Anybody has a question? Dr. Arpan, you were the first speaker. Any yes, questions? Yes, ma'am. Panelists? Uh -huh. Uh, I I am very happy that uh, I started the talk with uh, my talk and then I covered a little bit on digital pathology and then got to see a lot of talks on smartphone uh, and digitalization. So I think, uh, and your talk on communication, ma'am, at least as somebody who heads the lab, if you don't communicate with the clinician and the clinician doesn't communicate with you, I think uh, you, 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 you start, you're losing the battle. So, no, I think communication is so important. We are all facing it, you know. If we didn't have Zoom or other platforms, we'll be stuck in, in silos, you know. We'll be just isolated. Yes, absolutely. This pandemic has taught us very important lessons, you know, how difficult it is to live in silos. And, and ma'am, we've trained young uh, women and they, the use of smartphone and they sending us pictures from secondary centers. It's been revolutionary. I mean, uh, trying to get a KOH and that for them to stay in and then we actually telling them what the fungus is and then they coming back and telling us sir is last time ye tha to is bari so something i mean it's really changed things it's exciting for that generation too to to True. actually look at uh, having said that i am all for smart people using smartphones and we have smart kids who are smarter than us <laughs> even more smarter phones yes but please, we must remember that there is no 
you know shortcut to human contact human Absolutely. touch too much yeah. of technology driven medicine or too much of technology driven interaction deletes the you know the human element in us and i'm seeing this at personal level because we are all surgeons you know we are taught to be aggressive aggression is in our genes otherwise we cannot cut so that aggression along with technology if it becomes if you're too smart forget that we are also have a human element so that balance is a little tricky and we are seeing this as these i am seeing this in the younger generation all of you who have kids would realize that lot of kids are having these problems especially in my college i am in mamsi medical college is largest medical college of india and i am finding a lot of isolation in these brilliant youngsters a lot of mental health issues are cropping up which we are ignoring because too much is you know technology driven everything so smartphones yes and that's that's amazing discovery i would say and it's made our life so much easier and has a outreach like as you said dr arpan said you can reach out and you know the people can transmit pictures and whatsapp for any other thing and what uh, john has just showed us it is innovation and you can just transform lives of so many people at the same time we must remember that balance is important nature has taught us balance and we must not forget that balance in our zeal to perfect something absolutely ma'am i mean the day we realize that that's not the way to go one of the one of the wrong doings or the side effects of either of them is going to come up so we don't want that for sure thing of glaucoma patient comes to me my students get an oct done a perimetry done a gonio done everything maris i mean at least talk to the patient and ask him or oh, her what is the problem and many patients say the doctor never asked me never even touched me and found out what is my problem you know they said do this 1 2 3 4 5 6 test i mean you are basing your interpretation on tests so just the human touch and otherwise of course balance if we can find the balance this generation or this tech, this era is really amazing is dr ekeda there yeah we were filling in for dr ekeda so you all you all the the talk Uh, good morning, ma'am. I'm so sorry. I was uh, in another session uh, judging one of the free papers. I'm sorry about the delay. I'll just start my talk. Experience our experience with the uh, new corneal tattoo gun. So, any questions people have, they can take it up. We still have around 15 minutes. Uh, is my screen visible and am I audible? Yeah, it's visible and you're audible. Go for the slideshow. Yes, ma'am. So a uh, very good morning to everyone I would like to share our experience with the new novel corneal tattoo gun device which was used for corneal tattooing in eyes with disfiguring corneal scars So what are the current treatment options that we have available for patients who have corneal opacity and nil visual prognosis who require a better aesthetic outcome The treatment options that we have include cosmetic contact lenses though sometimes the fitting can be poor for these patients as they have an irregular corneal contour there's the additional hassle of having to wear and remove them every day and hygiene related issues the second option that we have is that of a cosmetic keratoplasty these patients need to be on long term follow up require suture removal and there are associated complications like graft infiltrate and rejection the third option is that of corneal tattooing This can either be performed by carrying out a stromal dissection and creating a pocket which can be challenging in patients with irregular contour and soft prethysical eyes. The second way to do this technique is by anterior stromal puncture which can be a slow process and lacks uniformity. Therefore looking at this lacunae we carried out a study wherein we uh, studied the cosmetic outcome uh, with the new tattoo gun device which was imported from China by a collaboration of approximately 50 eye surgeons in India so the purpose of our study was to evaluate the cosmetic efficacy as well as safety of this device it was a retrospective non comparative clinical case series study and we uh, we chose 21 eyes of 21 patients who underwent tattooing procedure with this device a complete ocular examination including slit lamp photography and ocular ultrasonography was performed for all patients and all the procedures were performed under topical anesthesia by the same surgeon that is i uh, took the uh, took these patients up for surgery This is the tattoo gun device. Here, this consists of uh, a console, a handpiece, uh, a foot pedal, and a power adapter. From the console, we can actually change the oscillations per second, 
and the needle depth uh, the needle length that protrudes out of the handpiece can be controlled by rotating this dial all these patients uh, we use the pre sterile jet black uh, tattoo ink to uh, do the tattooing procedure for these patients uh, the needle length with the hand piece can be rotated and it can be varied from 0.5 to 3 mm and in our experience keeping the needle length at 0 mm was adequate so let's take a look at the surgical procedure this is a 26 year old patient who presented to us with left eye exotropia spheroidal degeneration and corneal scarring here i'm using a 15 number blade to debride the spheroidal degeneration so that we can ensure a smooth corneal surface it is very important that we have a small smooth bed so that we get a good cosmetic outcome now if we see if uh, we try to do a stromal dissection in these patients it can be quite challenging because of the irregular corneal scar that we have once we have a smooth surface we can go ahead and apply the tattoo ink so here we are using a 1 ml syringe with a 27 gauge cannula and a pre sterile jet black tattoo ink is being applied on the cornea we use jet black for all our cases as indian eyes have dark colored iris we can see how neatly we can apply the tattoo ink without any spillage onto the conjunctiva after applying the tattoo ink this dye is going to be pushed in with the uh, disposable needle which is mounted on the hand piece we kept the oscillations at 3 per second and the needle length at 0 so this actually pushes in the dye anti into the anterior stroma and this makes the process very fast and we get a uniform pigmentation throughout then we are washing off the excess dye and evaluating the result that we have achieved after thorough cleaning we can selectively go in and again place the pigment in the areas which require a little bit more of the tattooing so again we take uh, the corneal tattoo gun and we repeat this procedure this can be done 3 to 4 times depending on the need uh, it is a very precise device and we can see that we can even go very close to the limbus and uh, take care of the corneal periphery which is very difficult to do if you are do, uh, creating the traditional stromal pocket and a bandage contact lens is applied at the end of the procedure post operatively these patients were prescribed steroid eye drops antibiotic eye drops and lubricant eye drops the bandage contact lens was removed on 10th post operative day and in this study we followed up all the patients for a minimum of 6 months duration so when we analyzed our results uh, out of the 21 patients 6 were females and 15 were males with a mean age of 30 years ranging from 13 to 61 years the most common cause of corneal opacification without any visual prognosis in our series was trauma At six months follow up, nineteen patients out of twenty-one, that is ninety percent, were satisfied with the appearance, and out of these, nearly thirty percent were extremely happy and satisfied with the cosmetic result that they achieved. These are the pre-operative and post imaged post-operative face photographs of these patients who underwent the tattooing procedure, and we can see that uh, the, there is a significant difference in the aesthetic appearance. These are the slit lamp images of patients who were unsatisfied with the procedure. The first case we had a delayed healing of an epithelial defect. This patient developed an epithelial defect one month after the tattooing procedure, and this, even though the epithelial defect uh, healed, but this led to the central fading of the pigment in the area of the defect. The second patient here is uh, the patient who had an inferior corneal scar, and uh, this patient developed a, a mild uh, fading of the pigment over here inferiorly after one year. So this is one year follow up, and she noted a slight fading of the pigment, and she underwent a repeat tattooing procedure. These are the slit lamp photographs, pre-operatively and post-operatively images showing an excellent cosmetic outcome at six months follow up. to conclude the tattooing procedure with the novel device is associated with high patient satisfaction of 90% no significant complications were reported at a minimum follow up of 6 months therefore it is a safe effective and affordable technique to improve the cosmetic appearance in these eyes 
Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Ikeda. Although I'm a little skeptical about things made in China now, but obviously yes, this is working. <laughs> uh, and um, so this is India Ink. You're using India Ink for the uh, for the dye. Uh, Ma'am, we are actually using uh, the pre-sterile dye that we buy from Amazon or it's available at uh, various uh, uh, tattoo stores as well. So this is not India Ink, Ma'am. This is actually the dye that is used for dermal tattooing, but we ensure that this is pre-sterile and uh, jet black. So there are different colors available and we uh, use the jet black color for these patients. That's okay. So if this dye is meant for dermal application and we are translating that into ocular ap 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 application, is, are there any problems which you have seen? Like uh, not so far, ma'am. So the only complications you have? Six months is the minimum follow-up, ma'am. I have uh, at least uh, nine patients who have been following up with me for more than a year. And the only complication, uh, or we can say uh, what we have noted is that in some patients, there's a slight fading of the pigment, like the pictures that I showed, but mm -hmm. no serious complications, uh, no re uh, abnormal reactions or ocular inflammation, no infectious keratitis has been noted. So these patients are really happy with the cosmetic thinning? outcome. Any stromal thinning happening over a period of time? Uh, not so far, ma'am. I have noted uh, no stromal thinning. Only the first uh, patient that I showed, I'll just go back to that slide. That's okay. So I just wanted to ask because this is a, how do you autoclave? I mean, you autoclave this or ETO it? How do you sterilize this dye? So, ma'am, it is best to use a different bottle for a different patient because we, if we, uh, this will, the autoclave will not work on this dye. Uh, the liquid will not get autoclaved. Mm -hmm. And again, the ETO, it might change the consistency as well. And I don't think the ETO as well will be effective. So, it is not very expensive, ma'am. Uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, it costs about 500, 600 rupees. So, it, we can easily use a separate bottle for different patients. Some people have also, what they have done. Ensure, uh, the bottle separate is fine. How do you ensure that the bottle is sterile? Ma'am, the bottle itself is pre-sterile. So that bottle that is given by the company itself is pre-sterile. They, they give the ink is sterile. And there are people, uh, Dr. Aditya Pradhan, especially who has been using this technique, uh, what they are doing is that if they don't change the bottle, then they use, they uh, withdraw with a different sterile syringe and they keep sending the dye for culture to make sure that it's not infected. So if they keep getting the sterile cultures, then we can actually use this bottle for a little longer as well. Okay. Thank you. You can stop sharing your slides, Dr. Ikeda. Thank any, you, ma'am. Any questions to the, any of the speakers? Anybody wishes to have a question? All right. So I have one question for John. John, is it marketed, your device? Uh, not yet, ma'am. Uh, but I have been getting uh, inquiries from people. So I think I'm, I should go ahead with that. Yeah, but then if you want to make it available, you should link it up actually with the peripheral centers and that can have a huge uh, you know, market there because affordability is an issue there. Yes, ma'am. So I I, uh, I see this as part of the kit of every postgraduate student also. Mm -hmm. So instead of uh, just having a direct ophthalmoscope, which they were having till now, they should have a you fundus know, camera. It really needs to be in the museum. It's fossilized. <laughs> in fact, uh, COVID was the final, uh, yeah, final straw. Final, final, <laughs> final because of COVID, they have started taking their indirects and now they're using the bottle funders cameras also. So when they go for the, uh, the duty calls, they take the bottle funders camera and those who have the indirect, they take that. The fundus camera would be very useful when we have, we used to, we used to have the gynae calls, we have to check for the eclampsia patients. It's, yes, and the neuro patients who were admitted who, who were on the bed, they couldn't move. This would be very useful there because the portable cameras are too heavy to carry. Yes, ma'am. So uh, I'm working on a foldable one also. So uh, I'll, I'll update with that soon. Okay. Um, Thank you. This was a wonderful, wonderful session. All of you had just presented different aspects of ophthalmology and that was very, very, very illuminating. Carry on the work. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes, so uh, I think we can end the session. Sir. We can leave? Yeah. Okay.
It starts at 12 now. Hi, ma'am. Yes, 12. Hi. Welcome, Partho, Dr. Thank you, sir. You are in notes. Uh, Hi, Partho. Uh, she should not be coming, ma'am. Why? He is saying, Mary OPD hai and I cannot uh, come. Hi, ah, I'm thought of it. Yeah. I think for virtual, it, matlab, normally to tum nikal ke jaate ho na, in person meeting mein, so, but when you are doing virtual, somehow chutti leke tum ghar bhi nahi baithte. Haan, and, and, and we didn't get the information so much on time ki block kar le ya kuch kar le. Haan, hai, that's also true. Trend has changed ma'am. Earlier UVI used to be the last day. Now, it has come to the first day session. You have to bring it to Hall A. Yeah. Now all hall, hall, all the A. Virtually every hall is A. Yeah, but Sunday, Sunday, Sunday is the Hall A now. Yeah, Retina is in Hall A, which is interesting because Hall A used to be FICO, FICO, FICO. Yes. Although, like Amit says, the Hall really doesn't matter now. I think what uh, what we need to do is to, uh, uh, make a lot of webinars on UBITs and have it on a YouTube channel. Like Neuroophthal has done a good job. The Neuroophthalmologists have had about at least 15, 20 symposiums. Okay. And we're having uh, good speakers and good content. Okay. So if we can make a, a, a 20, 20, 30 uh, UBI uh, webinars and record them on YouTube, I think we'll get an interest into this. A lot of people would be interested. Sure. Uh, Amit sir, next time when you know DOS ka bhi pata kafi advanced mein chal jata hai, to aap mujhe bhi pata hai. I came to know, I came to know the field is four days back. This program I discussed with you submitted in February, but they were kind enough to maintain that program, but we had submitted in February. We could have added more speakers. Otherwise, we could have added one more session of UVITIS. People are doing a good job. UVI society is doing those uh, once a month webinars. I uh, stopped them now. Uh, maybe we'll restart from January. I think uh, uh, 
uvia society can do webinars on one disease you know intermittent uveitis toxo like one disease per time so that's what we were doing that's what we were doing that's what Last two good and diagnostic. It's available in YouTube, sir. You can go and see. No, no, I've seen them. I'm just saying for that is for That's UVA for specialist. Sir, yeah. If we create fifty lectures for postgraduates, or thirty or forty for postgraduates, which who can you know uh, revise UVA through those lectures, uh, that will be worthwhile. Shall we start? It's twelve. Absolutely. Hi, Padma. Hello. Good afternoon. Yeah. yeah. So welcome, yeah. everybody. Yeah. Welcome everybody to the UPS session at DOS, a virtual one. We have Dr. Vishali, who needs no introduction, who will be talking on consensus uh, to treat TB. Dr. Vishali. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, DOS, for this kind opportunity. My topic is simple. Uh, I would like to begin with the TB is confusing, but since we don't speak the common language, so we ourselves get confused, and then we end up confusing the physicians whom we expect to start anti-TB therapy. So with a venture to be on a single platform and to develop consensus amongst the global expert community, we started this venture of course. So initially, we collected the real-world data, which means how everybody was managing TB in the current scenario. And what we found in the big data was more than 90% of the patients do not have any evidence of systemic disease. And <clears throat> Montius was still the most commonly performed test in 87% and TB gold in 89%. Chest CT was better than X-ray if you are looking for old exposure to TB. And the outcomes were actually best for serpiginous like coronitis. Very interestingly, if you initiate therapy in time and you have made the right diagnosis of TB, uh, the treatment failure was seen only in 12.4%. So when we collected the real world data, we realized that anti-TB drug is very effective in reducing the recurrences. However, what is the problem? The problem is we did not have any consensus or any guidelines which we could tell physician as to when to start TB. So what I'm going to talk in the next five minutes or so is what are the expert consensus guidelines in deciding the indications for starting anti-TB therapy for ocular TB? So for this, we did a very extensive survey and thank you, Amit, and most of you were a part of it. So it was dependent on the phenotype it will present. The next was where did the patient belong to? Endemic or non-endemic region? The third was was it a first episode? Was it a recurrent episode? Were we dealing with the active or inactive disease? And then we had a permutation and combination of different tests. What if only PPD is present? What if only chest or CT is present? What if quantiferon and IGRA are positive? What if only IGRA is positive? And so on. So we had a huge number of uh, questions that experts rated on the probability, that is very high probability to start, or very low probability. So it was a kind of a graded response and not only yes or no. So this is where uh, we will start with serpiginous like choroiditis because that was the phenotype which everybody agreed upon was very specific for TB. So some of the things had a very strong consensus and first is if you have a patient of serpiginous like choroiditis, it could be from either region, endemic or non-endemic, and you have all the three tests positive. That is, you have PPD, IGRA, and CT positive. Go ahead and start ATT. The second scenario is SLC patient from any region 
both the immunological tests are positive. That is PPD and EGRA, 90% consensus to start anti-TB drugs. The third scenario was patient SLC from anywhere, endemic or non-endemic, and either PPT or EGRA positive and chest X-ray RCT positive, which means one immunologic, one radiologic, strong consensus to start TB treatment. Now, some of the uh, questions were kind of controversial and at the borderline, and they went on to Delphi two round. And in this round, there were few parameters which were added. That was a patient with SLC from any region with one immunological test positive. I mean, experts felt that if the phenotype is very strong and the expert feels serpiginous like choroditis could be TB, there was a moderate consensus that you could start anti-TB drugs. Interestingly, when we talk of the single test, the experts from endemic region relied more on PPD skin test, which means that if in a country like India, you see serpiginous like choroditis and PPD positive start ATT, whereas if it is Europe or America, they relied more on IGRA and not on PPT. There was a unanimous consensus on starting concomitant corticosteroids because otherwise it leads to paradoxical worsening. However, the experts could not reach a consensus on intravitreal injection of steroids or methotrexate, and they were left to the individuals like managing physician who were the best judge as to which one to give in case of paradoxical worsening. Regarding the multifocal choroditis, there was not much consensus, but when it came to tuberculoma, the phenotype is so highly suggestive that even if one test was positive, experts agreed on giving. Uh, we do have all the things available, so in seven minutes I can't go on the details, but those needing more details, both papers are in ophthalmology. The second consensus was about anterior uveitis. Again, the paper is published and will be available. But very interestingly, even when all the three tests are positive, experts had a very strong consensus to treat only in the recurrent episode. First episode, one or two tests positive of anterior uveitis, there was no consensus whether you should be adding anti-TB drugs. Coming to intermediate uveitis, uh, there was no strong consensus to start, only moderate consensus, and that too if both the tests, if the three tests were positive. And pan uveitis, of course, there was a strong consensus to start if all the three tests were positive. Regarding the retinal vasculitis, inactive retinal vasculitis, there was no consensus to treat. Active occlusive vasculitis with patches, the phenotype typical for TB, there was consensus to treat if all the three or at least two tests were positive. So I, would be, I have been presenting this on behalf of all of you and many others who have been part of COPS. Thank you very much for your kind hearing. Thank you, Dr. Vishali. Uh, I think it will remove doubt from a lot of people who want who treat tuberculosis with uveitis. Are you working on any other project on the courts further? Are we looking for further we have protocols? Changed, uh, we, we, we will be very soon coming up with the new, this thing, Titan. Titan is about consensus about treating the viral interior uveitis because that's something, again, very confusing, the duration, the a topical versus systemic, CMB versus, so we will be, I mean, it's already, I think, advanced stage of analysis. So Amit, we will be moving towards that. Thank you so much. Anyone has a question for Dr. Vishali? Thank you, Thank you Dr. Vishali. Uh, yeah. Do we have Dr. Dhal online? Dr. Dhal is not online. Uh, Dr. Arvind Subramaniam, I think he's not presenting. Uh, 
Uh, Dr. Manisha wanted to go to the next session. Dr. Manisha would like to uh, present. Yes, sir. I can present. Dr. Manisha. Or I can be whatever. Yeah, please, 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 please go. Okay, sir. Please go ahead. Please, please, please. Can you see my screen, sir? Yeah, yeah, we can see okay. your screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Doss and Dr. Amit for giving me this opportunity. So in the coming few minutes, I would be speaking on the tailored approach to lab investigations. So uh, whenever we see a patient of uveitis, we have a tendency to order a battery of investigations. And uh, this is keeping in mind because there are different etiologies involved. It could be an infectious and autoimmune disease, or it could be even a masquerade syndrome. So our reaction to managing a patient of uveitis is often costly, but it is sometimes inefficient and often misleading if we do not do a tailored approach to the investigations. So depending on the type of uveitis we are dealing with, we should be deciding on the specific investigations to be done for that particular patient. And this not only includes the lab investigations, but also we get a clue to the lab investigations depending on our clinical findings. So a detailed workup is absolutely mandatory. And when we do an ocular examination, it of course involves uh, 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 in, uh, assessment of the best corrected visual acuity, a detailed slit lamp examination, and of course a dilated fundus examination where we tend to note down the various signs that we can see. And then we have to also make a, a diagnosis of the kind or the type of uveitis that we are dealing with, which depends on the anatomical location, the clinical diagnosis, whether it's acute, chronic, or a recurrent, it's active or inactive, or it's a granulomatous or a non-granulomatous, and also the underlying etiological diagnosis, whether it's idiopathic, infectious, or a non-infectious. A uveitis oriented history is of extreme importance because it again provides us uh, various clues to the underlying etiology of the uveitis that we are dealing with. So supposingly if a patient has a recurrent uveitis with a history of low back stiffness upon awakening each morning, then we would think of something like an ankylosing spondylitis and then we would order targeted investigations like a HLA B27, an X-ray of the lumbosacral spine. Now, based on the ocular examination, again, the various signs are noted. So if we have mutton fat KPs, we would think of various granulometers etiologies like TB and sarcoidosis. If we have a retinochoroiditis adjacent to an old scar, we would be thinking of toxoplasma. So depending on the clinical signs that we see is going to be helping us direct or order our tailored investigations for a particular patient. Now, when would we like to order investigation? The first question is, or we would just like to go ahead and give some first line management. So general indications for investigations would be when the patient has the first attack of mild uveitis, it is usually not requiring any investigation. But if we have a patient with a bilateral disease, the first attack is very severe. We have posterior uveitis, a child with a mild, uh, uh, a child with a uveitis, anterior uveitis not responding to the usual treatment, or a recurrent anterior uveitis. As far as the uveitic entities, which do not usually require investigations, these again would be something like a post-traumatic uveitis or a post-operative uveitis, where we know there is a triggering factor which is involved, and it is a one-time trigger. Now, as far as the indications of indi uh, investigations are concerned, again, infectious etiologies like TB, syphilis, and toxo, they surely need an uh, uh, investigation for confirming the diagnosis. Again, for uh, diseases like a sarcoid, we have to uh, confirm the clinical diagnosis and the investigations are going to be mandatory. Sometimes also to rule out the masquerade syndromes like retinoblastoma or lymphoma. And also the risk of treatment we have to order when we are starting drugs like immunosuppressants. Now the investigations can be both non-ocular or they can be ocular. And sometimes we may also need to resort to a diagnostic surgery when with extensive investigations, we still are lost on the diagnosis. 
Now, I'll just briefly give you a case example where we had this 38-year-old unmarried female patient who presented with pain, redness, blurring of vision in the left eye for last five days, complaining of photophobia and floaters in the left eye. She had a whole lot of comorbidities like hypothyroidism, she was having anemia, esophageal reflux, and for which she was already being treated. In the left eye, the vision was as low as hand movement close to face and she had a mild AC reaction with keratic precipitates and iris pigments were present on the anterior lens capsule. Now, the, the, this is the right eye where you see a huge posterior placoid of retinochoroditis and the left eye. Again, you have a patch of the retinochoroditis which is involving the posterior pole with these distinct precipitates present over the retina. So if a person doesn't know this clinical picture, this is what is going to happen. So the patient was advised investigations and was lost to follow up for three weeks and was investigated elsewhere, where you see she underwent a whole battery of investigations, including an RA factor and even an HLA B27, which absolutely had nothing to do with the clinical picture of this particular patient. So uh, she also underwent investigations for toxo, for various viral teeters. And what was distinct was that she underwent a mantoops, which was recorded as zero. So this, was, this is something to be highlighted is that sometimes even a negative result is of importance because if a patient has a zero mantoops, you probably are dealing with an immunosuppressed patient. So she was diagnosed elsewhere as a viral retinitis because her viral teeters were high and was put on antivirals, one gram TDS with oral steroids. But she presented back to us again after one month where she started complaining of blurring of vision in the right eye for last two days. And she had ocular pain in both eyes. And now we see that even the right eye vision had drastically dropped down to 636 and 24. So she had this typical ground glass retinochoroditis in both the eyes. She had these superficial retinal precipitates. So we knew now the disease was progressing and it was starting to involve both the eyes. This is on fundus fluorescein angiography where you have this diffused hyperfluorescence that you see. We have a hot disc. We have an element of vasculitis also. And also these hyperfluorescence spots which were corresponding with those precipitates that we saw clinically. When we saw uh, on the OCT, there were these distinct intraretinal superficial precipitates. And the first thing which was in our mind was that probably we were dealing with an immunosuppressed patient. And all you know, it was an underlying syphilis, which very typically was like uh, resembling the clinical picture. So when we saw this patient, we investigated this patient further. Her HIV-1 was reactive, so she was immunosuppressed. Her CD4 counts were low to 198, and the VDRL came out to be positive, but we wanted to confirm it further, so TPHA again was found to be positive. So she was started on heart therapy along with all the other uh, drugs as advised by the physician, along with the benzathin penicillin, and oral valcyclovir and the oral steroids, they were stopped. A CSF analysis was done for neurosyphilis, which was found to be positive. She was added uh, with another antibiotic in the form of monocef. And after three weeks of treatment, her CSF sample came out to be negative for VDRL. So after two weeks of treatment, uh, you see that the lesions had drastically improved and her right eye looked much better. She recovered a vision of 618N6 in the right eye. But unfortunately, because of the delay and the whole gamut of investigations that she went through, we lost the left eye vision completely. The follow-up at six months, she recovered a vision of 612N6 in the right eye, but the left eye continued to have extremely poor vision. You see all those superficial retinal precipitates, they were completely resolved on the OCT. And we also published this particular case as syphilitic uveitis, misdiagnosed as viral retinitis, where a misleading history was the main thing which misled the physicians who were treating this particular patient. So I would just conclude by saying that investigations in uveitis should be guided by the clinical clues, which includes both a detailed history and the examination. The availability and the cost factor of the test, they should always be kept in mind. And the tests have to be tailored for each patient. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Manisha. Uh, would you suggest that uh, in patients of uh, when would you get a HIV test? Any, uh, or you would uh, think of getting it done in all posterior 
I think in current situation, because most often we would be thinking of starting oral steroids for these patients, and if they're not responding, sometimes we have to even think of immunosuppressants. I think testing for HIV has become like a first line test because most often the posterior uveitis patients, they would be requiring oral corticosteroids for a long term. So I think the first line or first thing which we would like to rule out is that the patient is not immunosuppressed. And also sometimes uh, if you are dealing with an infectious pathology like tuberculosis and all, and if the patient is already immunosuppressed, we have to be careful that these patients can, you know, uh, not really respond the way we are looking to when we are going to be starting the treatment. So I think in my uh, hands, HIV testing or uh, ruling out any other immunosuppressive pathology would be like a first line investigation. I would just like to highlight the national TB program has uh, suggested that all TB patients be uh, tested for HIV. Right. So they, they can pick up. Thank you, Dr. Manisha. Thank you. Uh, we have any questions from the other panelists? Dr. Reema, welcome to the uh, online lecture. Are you ready with, uh, she will be speaking on how to decode a case of retinal vascular. Dr. Reema Bansal from PG. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Dr. Amit, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, we can see your slides. Please go ahead. All right. So uh, thank you, Dr. Amit, and thank you, Doss, for this opportunity to speak on uh, how to decode retinal vasculitis. So few terms uh, create as much misunderstanding as retinal vasculitis. The ophthalmologists and rheumatologists have a very different perspective and different threshold for diagnosing vasculitis. Now, if you look at the rheumatologist's perspective, they classify vasculitis on the basis of the size of the vessel affected, its location, and the associated histological changes. And for them, biopsy plays the major role. Whereas from our perspective, the retinal vasculitis is diagnosed on the basis of the fundus findings and imaging, mainly fluorescein and geography. And biopsy does not really have a role for us. Now, why fluorescein and geography in retinal vasculitis? You look at this case where the patient presents with blurry vision, slightly blurry vision in the right eye. And all that you see is mild haze in the vitreous in the right eye. And we really don't uh, identify any particular phenotype of uveitis here. So unless we do a fluorescein in geography, which not only tells the uh, pattern the, there is active vasculitis, it also tells us the pattern of vasculitis. And from here, we can just make a diagnosis of Beschett's vasculitis. Now, when you look at vasculitis, we have a certain thought process going on in our mind. First of all, is this process infectious? Because even if it is non-infectious, we can take care of that. But if it is infectious and we miss it, then we are in trouble. Coming to the infectious etiologies, we know TB, toxo, viral, and syphilis. And non-infectious by and large include sarcoidosis, Beschett's, collagen vascular diseases, multiple sclerosis, and idiopathic vasculitis like Irvine. Now, it's important to do the pattern recognition of retinal vasculitis, what type of vessels are involved, whether they're large, medium, small, or capillaries, whether it's occlusive or non-occlusive, whether the vasculitis is focal, diffuse, is it limited only to the posterior pole, mid-periphery or periphery? Are there any associated lesions in the posterior or interior segment? And always look for clues of healed uveitis in the same eye as well as in the fellow eye. Now, if you have a phenotype like this, we know there is a choroidal granuloma, there is vasculitis, so it's easy to make the most common differential, which is TB here. Here also, if you look at the vasculitis and if you pick up these perivascular choroiditis scars along with disc edema, you think of tubercular vasculitis as the main etiology here. Now you have these two different patients presenting with subtle kind of maculopathy, retinitis in the eyes. Now the one on the top, you just identify retinitis unless you do a fluorescein in both the eyes and you see that there is vasculitis also. So here, now what kind of vasculitis are you dealing with here with macular retinitis? Now, if you look at the clues, whether in the same eye or in the other eye, it's helping you, it's going to help you. Now, look at the top example where we found a toxo scar in the fellow eye. So we now knew that we are dealing with the toxo retinitis in this right eye on the top. And the one on the bottom, we look for these scars in the periphery where you can identify the uh, toxo scars in the periphery. So both the cases are of toxo, but it is a fluorescein which gave us a clue of the existing vasculitis and the clues in the same or the fellow eye of the etiology. 
when you have this large toxo uh, granuloma in the periphery in the superior periphery but sometimes these toxo lesions could be very small and you might miss them because of being peripheral in location and because of extensive vitreitis but if you see this kind of chiralis arteritis you should pick up this clue of being toxo in the eye so we need to also know whether the arteries are involved primarily or the veins are involved or both are involved and we have certain differentials in depending upon what kind of uh, vessels are involved so whether the vasculitis is associated with any retinitis where we think of toxo viral bechets or sle or there is any choroiditis that when we think of tb or sarcoid we should also see whether there is any cystoid maculoedema along with vasculitis when we think of tb sarcoid or vascular occlusions which are inflammatory or when there is no cme like an intraocular lymphoma beginning as vasculitis toxo cme is not very common although it is there herpetic vasculitis cme is rare bechets may occur with or without cme so you have this patient a young male who came to us for left eye vitreous hemorrhage for surgery and since he was a young male um, we planned him for of course for the left eye surgery but we just thought of uh, doing a fluorescein angiography because we did not find any obvious cause of vitreous hemorrhage in this patient so as expected the left eye revealed lot of new vessels and subhaloid bleed the right eye posterior pole was normal on examination so the fundus was normal as expected but to our surprise we found that there was a large new vascular frond in the upper temporal periphery lower nasal periphery and large ischemic areas in the upper nasal periphery so this was the right eye normal eye so we got him investigated for tb so we took him up for surgery in the left eye and this is how he responded with the endolaser photocoagulation and vitrectomy and the right eye we did the prophylactic scatolaser photocoagulation and this was the follow up at 5 years where he's doing both uh, both the eyes are doing well so we this is the baseline fluorescein in the left eye and you can see the fluorescein that we repeated at 5 years he's doing well similarly the baseline fluorescein in the right eye and this is what the fluorescein was at 5 years after scatter laser photocoagulation so we could save his right eye also so coming to the other forms of tb vasculitis it can present with perivascular cuffing like this in all the quadrants or as i showed you earlier with disc edema and perivascular choroiditis scars or just capillary non perfusion on fluorescein angiography which is not evident clinically or with inflammatory brvo which have a significant amount of cystoid maculoedema or just a perivascular choroiditis scar so this case which had significant vitreitis you really don't suspect vasculitis here unless you do a fluorescein so this was a case of sarcoid vasculitis with multifocal choroiditis which responded very well and you can see the media clearing up even the fluorescein showing absence of vasculitis on resolution so another case a young male presenting with left eye vitreous hemorrhage do not ignore the other normal looking eye because here again in the periphery we found this large uh, fibrovascular proliferation which confirmed to be leaking on fluorescein and these uh, inflammatory uh, vasculitis with cme respond very well to uh, steroids uh, injections exudative maculopathy again if you have this kind of picture you have some sheathing of vessels but there's no obvious vasculitis always do a fluorescein which just gives you straightforward diagnosis of ervan here so an ischemic type of vasculitis where you have lots of cotton wool spots uh, in the posterior pole and you see the arteries and veins are almost knocked down and if you look at the nasal periphery you have these perivascular hemorrhages we don't you see the complete uh, damage to the vessel arteries as well as veins so there is lot of ischemic component going on so do just confirm your findings on fluorescein and you have such a grave picture here so these kind of cases of vasculitis need urgent treatment very aggressive treatment so that you prevent the blinding complications to summarize the ancillary tests which are very important in vasculitis are steroid maculoedema uh, to be picked up by the oct and fluorescein angiography more important than autofluorescence in icg it gives you the pattern recognition additional clues the vasculitis being active or inactive and laboratory tests of course being targeted so this is usually identified on the basis of perivascular infiltrates leakage of dye on fluorescein angiography and other evidence for intraocular inflammation and please remember that vast majority of patients with retinal vasculitis do not have a systemic vasculitis so thank you very much thank you dr reema uh what 
factors would you suggest investigating uh, for a system vasculitis? When would you investigate for a system? Would I be the presenting feature for a systemic vasculitis? Yeah, so as I said before, uh, systemic vasculitis is not really common with rectal vasculitis unless you identify a particular pattern, a particular phenotype. So like the last case I showed you uh, with a lot of cotton wool spots and ischemic and a young male with sudden loss of vision and everything developing very fast, we did investigate this patient for uh, lupus and other collagen vascular disorders. We did not find any clue. So these are the kind of patients where we would be aggressive for systemic workup. Now, if you have a young male with uh, uh, vitreous hemorrhage or vasculitis, I think we would think first of uh, doing a workup for TB. Otherwise, a basic workup in all patients with vasculitis is Good. important. And then Beshitz, we, we find clues on fluorescein. So just for the audience, would you think a, a young patient of CRA would require inflammatory workup? Not really. Uh, just a uh, CRAO being the only finding is not. I have not come across where we found a case of underlying vasculitis. But when CRAO is combined with CRVO, yes, we have seen a, a case of a bilateral CRAO with CRVO as the presenting manifestation of HIV disease, where the patient had uh, uh, tuberculosis elsewhere in the body. So he was detected as having all these systemic complications after he presented with bilateral CRO CRV. And other, otherwise, uh, these combined CRO with any kind of other pathology, one must in, uh, investigate for uh, vasculitis. So these cases could also be presenting as uh, perineuritis. So there becomes the role of you know additional pathology being there. The isolated CRO not really. Thank you, Dr. Rima. Do we have Dr. Padmamali? She'll be speaking on approach to non-infectious coronavirus. Dr. Padmamali, can you unmute Dr. Padmamali? Dr. Padma? We can't hear Dr. Padma. Can we have the next speaker in the meanwhile? Dr. Partha Pratham, uh, Majumta, would you be ready to give your talk? Yeah, just Am I, let me. Yeah. Let me and Dr. Padma Pali has come online. Thank you. Can you unmute yourself? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'll can uh, I think Dr. Yeah, let her finish. Uh, yeah. I can Dr. wait. I can can wait. you share your screen, Dr. Padma? Yeah. Dr. Padma, can you share your screen? Sure, sure, sir. Can you see my screen? Yeah, please, please, please go ahead. Let's make it full screen. It's good afternoon to all of you. I'd also I'd like to thank Dr. Ami and Das for inviting me here today to speak on approach to non infective coronavirus. Whenever you see a lesions on the fascia margins, it always is a confusion. What are you seeing in the fundus? What is it? These patients present with decreased vision, flow tests, flashes, or seeing black spots in the eye. Retinitis will have whitish, ill defined margins with retinal ED diagnosis of coronitis lesion. And how are you going to differentiate whether it's an active or healed coronitis? The active, ill defined margins with yellowish lesions, whereas the healed ones are white color lesions due to fibrous tissue proliferations and thinning and atrophy. They are surrounded by black zone of RTE pigments. Approach to coronitis is similar to any other uveitis where we have detailed history, complete ocular examination with dilated fundus, systemic evaluations with relevant investigations and treat the patients appropriately. Coming to non-infective coronitis can be classified into unifocal or multifocal or diffuse, unifocal sarcoidosis and masquerade sums. In multifocal, again, 
diffuse can be divided into diseases affecting the chorio capillaries or stromal choroid. In the chorio capillaries, the white dot syndrome comes in the picture in that APM PPE and also the punctate inner choroidopathy will come. Whereas in stromal choroiditis, we have serpiginous choroiditis, VKH, sympathetic ophthalmia, again, sarcoidosis can come along with masquerades. Coming to the ophthalmic investigations, fundus autofluorescence plays a role, assess the disease activity, diseases affecting the RTE choriocapillary complex like serpiginous choroiditis. Fundus fluorescent angiography and ICG can be combined to study the retinal and the choroidal circulation in a case of a choroiditis. FFA as early IPO with late ISO or hyperfluorescence. Shows hypofluorescent with late hypo or isofluorescent oil. OCT helps us to study the morphological coronitis, and also we can measure coronal thickness with coronal granulomas, coronitis lesion in this case. OCT angiography shows. Flowoid area in the choroid corresponding to the areas of the choroiditis. That next we'll see in DGT. The serpiginous choroiditis is a bilateral chronic progressive recurrent inflammation of the capillary. It's believed to be an autoimmune object. And how do you differentiate from serpiginous like choroiditis, which is the choroiditis, the pigment again, choroiditis is immediate. All the investigations will become negative. Next, we move on to sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis is a chronic granulomatous multisystem disease. Choroiditis. You can have a unifocal or multifocal. Plus, you get mostly cystic validation. The matter is mostly negative. Elevated serum ACE and the lateral higher lymphadenopathy with the microscopic lavage and biopsy. The tissue biopsy is the gold standard for the diagnosis of sarcoidosis of late increased CD4 by CD8 ratio either from the bronchial wash or from the ocular fluids are used to diagnose sarcoidosis. These patients respond well to systemic steroids and systemic immunosuppressive therapy. They have associated systemic component and then additional topical steroids can be given if they have associated ocular inflammation. The next comes BKH disease or what kind of heredar disease is a multi-system autoimmune disorder against the melanocytes characterized by multiple hypopigmented lesions mimicking choroiditis with associated serous retinal detachment. These patients will give history of headache and tinnitus. We make the diagnosis based on the clinical. The imaging shows disc leak with multiple pinpoint hyperfluorescence with pulling of the dye is a characteristic FFA pattern in a case of a VKH. But when you do ICG, it shows more extensive involvement of the choroid compared to FFA, where we could see multiple hypofluorescent dark darts in the choroid with staining and leakage of the choroidal vessels. OCT shows this little attachment with the septae with elevated choroidal bulge. You can see these patients are treated with high dose of intravenous methylprednisolone followed by systemic steroids, hit yearly and hit hard, followed by systemic immunosuppressive therapy. It's important to control the inflammation. The next, if you don't control the disease activity, patients can develop extraocular manifestations like coliosis, vitiligo, alopecia in the latter part of the disease. The next comes sympathetic ophthalmia. Here you could see that this is an ex exciting eye and sympathizing eye can have hypopigmented lesions with serous retinal detachment. Here again, we treat them with systemic steroids and immunosuppressive therapy to control the inflammation in this entity. History of trauma is given in sympathetic the findings 
is uh, same more or less in both the entities. Both the diseases as a clue funders as important clue to entity. Aggressive therapy with systemic corticosteroids should be initiated and it has to be slowly tapered over several months with systemic immunosuppressive therapy to control the inflammation in these cases. This entity has to be differentiated from other differential diagnoses such as masquerades. Multiple yellowish white lesions can, this can help us to diagnose the classical subtenon fluid or a T sign. And another thing is multifocal CSR where you have mean plot appearance. In CSR, with the yellowish lesions, we can have a pigmented structure in the fundus. Chorodytic entities have characteristic clinical features. Management is most important in this kind of issue. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Padmamali. Any questions? I'm ready to take talk. Any questions from the panelists? Thank you, Dr. Padma. Uh, we have Dr. Dr. Partha Pradham Pajanta will be speaking on biologicals in UVI. Thank you, Dr. We can see your screen. Please share. Thank you, Dr. Pradham Yeah. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank okay. you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks to uh, Team Delhi Ophthalmology Society and uh, Dr. Amit Khosla for uh, inviting me to uh, talk on biological in uveitis. Also, I'm thankful to uh, Dr. Amit Khosla, who constantly uh, keeps uh, motivating and inspiring us about uh, using this biological. So this is basically his topic. So I'll, I'll try to give an overview of my, uh, my use in my clinic, our clinic, and a uh, little bit of uh, summary of biologicals. So, uh, so biologicals are a group of biological, uh, biologically active proteins, uh, proteins and antibodies developed with the help of biological techniques. Perhaps that's why they use the name because it is, uh, it is developed with the help of biological techniques rather than uh, chemistry. So these are inhibitors of various cytokines and uh, causes targeted immunomodulation. Now, when we call that immune, uh, immune mod modulator and cytokine inhibitor, you just, if you look here, what happens normally if there is an inflammatory stimuli, so that acts on a cytokine gene and uh, the cytokine producing cell starts uh, acting and there is release of cytokine and the cytokine will get attached to cytokine receptor, which will carry the signal and there will be a biological effect. So here the uh, biological acts. There are drugs under the category of cytokine inhibitor. There are drugs under the category of cytokine receptor inhibitor, like this uh, daclizumab. And also there are drugs which act directly act on the lymphocyte, for example, rituximab. So th there are also various subclasses -class of uh, biologicals, which is not possible to cover in this seven minutes time. So one thing we should know that th there are certain classes of drugs which are derived from the murine uh, derivatives, followed by chimeric, then humanized. And now we have the fully human, which contains 100% of the human genome. So one thing we must remember that fully human and humanized antibodies carry a lower risk of inducing immunity, thereby producing less infusion reaction. Now we'll, we'll decide, uh, discuss here mainly about the TNF alpha inhibitors because this is the, these are the main drugs used in uh, mainly in rheumatology and uh, in our in ophthalmology also. So the TNF alpha, as you know, is an inflammatory cytokine which is produced by the macrophages and the monocytes. So during any acute inflammation, you will get a lot of uh, TNF alpha in, inside, in, near the site of inflammation. So now this TNF alpha binds to this TNF alpha receptor. There are two types of receptor, one and two. 
so this uh, once the uh, this receptor uh, binds to this uh, once the tnf alpha binds to the tnf receptor there will be inflammatory response and a diverse range of signaling events within the cell which will lead to necrosis apoptosis or various kind of inflama inflammatory stimuli so this tnf alpha are monoclonal antibody which uh, what what they do they does not al uh, the uh, particular drug they does not al uh, allow the tnf alpha to bind and cause this inflammatory response so that's why they are called tnf blocker now if you go through the uh, history of imm immunomodulator use you will realize that the ophthalmologists have closely followed the rheumatologists and picked up all their useful weapons for treating various kind of inflammation so it started from 1948 when philips hench uh, uh, discover uh, invented the uh, corticosteroid just after uh, i think two uh, two years the gordon and maclean used it in ophthalmology so similarly we have gradually we have taken the immunosuppressives and now the biologicals from our rheumatology colleague so this is a study actually which was first came uh, uh, reported the use of uh, infliximab in site threatening panuviatis in behcet disease perhaps this is the first study of biological use in in uh, in ophthalmology which was published in 2001 in india though we we were using the drug but the first case series actually came very late so the uh, fortunate uh, we we were the first person uh, first group who who reported this uh, biological use as a case series as you can see the first report was published in ocular immunology and inflammation we we uh, we administered the drug with the help of a rheumatologist uh, in 20 eyes of 14 patients and uh, 20 uh, 12 patients re uh, received adalimumab and two received golimumab so these were the indications basically the anterior uveitis posterior segment involvement and 93% of our patient had ankylospondylitis so this is uh, this uh, we followed this patient for 23 months uh, of uh, median time but there was no serious side effects so next uh, case series was also from our uh, our hospital where we treated 33 eyes of 18 patients where the basic disease were, were, was the most common clinical entity and we adalimumab uh, was used in 61% of cases uh, and the treatment success rate was 89% but two of them developed systemic side effect one patient developed systemic hypertension after infliximab therapy and another patient developed miliary tuberculosis after infliximab therapy so if you ask me the biological indi indication i'll be cautious and recommend only in severe inflammation inflammatory conditions like my first choice would be behcet disease the second will be gia and hla associated uveitis provided if they have any systemic association or the rheumatologist wants them to be on uh, uh, biological therapy the other cases are the resistance cases of sympathetic ophthalmia vkh necrotizing scleritis and chronic parts planitis which Uh, which are not responding to the standard immunosuppressive treatment i just show two cases and conclude my talk one is this 42 year old male known patient of hla b27 associated uveitis presented with persistent hypotony he has also received periocular steroid injection and was on frequent uh, topical steroid he also gave us history of backache and stiffness of knee joint and from the examination uh, report of rheumatologists we came to know that he had a painful intersegmental restriction in the movement of vertebra there was also effusion in the knee joints and a positive sober test so he was subsequently administered subcutaneous golimumab 50 mg and the injection was repeated every 4 weeks so they uh, on ubm there was complete resolution of the ciliary body edema and as you can see here the iop improved to 16 mm mm of mercury so this we published in indian journal of ophthalmology this is another patient present uh, 52 year old lady present known case of necrotizing scleritis for last 6 years she was being treated with all kind of drug as you see here methotrexate azathioprine cyclophosphamide cyclosporine all these drugs were tried uh, on her but she failed to achieve a steroid free remission and when she presented to us her, her base corrected visual acuity was 6 by 36 and left eye it was 6 by 9 
the interesting part was her iup was very high the leptide pressure was 45 mm mm of mercury so our glaucoma doctors wanted to uh, perform a amit amit valve surgery in her, uh, on her but because of the active sclerites uh, they they were not sure how to do and so in uh, in this scenario what we have decided we decided to go ahead with biologicals because the patient was already on three drug agm so we we started the patient on subcutaneous golimumab 50 mg and oral methotrexate 15 mg per week with the help of our rheumatologist and we repeated the drug and uh, you won't believe uh, in two months time the, there was complete resolution of the scleritis and uh, we we could successfully implant the amit amit glaucoma valve and his iop was 28 mm of mercury after the surgery so this is the picture went after the amit uh, glau glaucoma valve the iop was 8 mm of mercury and as you can see picture here this was picture after the biological therapy so my first case the hypotony was treated with biological am i recommending biologicals for treating hypotony no you have to understand the patient had serious systemic involvement so he was advised biological by the rheumatologist and which helped the hypotony to recover so here the primary indication was systemic the case two there was no system uh, significant systemic disease still we decided to go ahead with biological why because the scleritis was not responding to any of the available immune suppression so here the primary indication is ocular so one must remember in both the conditions we have taken care and we have uh, ruled out the infectious cause which is first uh, criteria to start the biological therapy coming to the uh, side effect of biological therapy i i would just like to highlight one uh, one point here the tnf alpha is one of the primary defense system against mycobacteria so uh, the use of tnf alpha blocker in a tb endemic country should be monitored closely you can start the uh, start start a patient on tnf alpha blocker but you have to regularly monitor the patient so another uh, drug is getting very popular nowadays the janus kinase uh, inhibitor so uh, because when this uh, the, popularly known as jack kinase inhibitor so it it ha it mainly mediates uh, the inflammation which uh, uh, use the signaling pathway including interleukin 2 and 6 so tofacitinib uh, is a drug which was approved by fda for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis psoriatic arthritis and ulcerative colitis we have used the drug uh, in two conditions one is in, on recalcitrant scleritis another is on bokk wanagi harada disease so both the cases we found that the drug acts re really uh, good when it comes to non uh, any any kind of exudative retinal detachment which is not responding to standard therapy because the drug, the mo molecule is very small so it more likely to cross the blood retinal barrier and there are added advantage of tnf inhibitor that will well absorbed we can give the oral dose and there are less risk of granulomatous diseases so to conclude my talk corticosteroid remains the workhorse in the treatment of uveitis you have to understand that horse cannot run continuously for a longer time you need supplement for that so immunosuppressive is that supplement now what is biological then so biological is like indian cheetah you have seen them they are very powerful very fast but you have to remember they can, they are wild difficult to control and sometimes disastrous so you required expertise and should be you, you should use this agents with caution thank you thank you for present please patient here thank you dr parth present uh, can you suggest for the audience how do you rule out uh, pre existing tb do you get an x ray chest and mon2 you get a ct chest and mon2 what do you do before you start a biological biologic biological first of all we we uh, use it very selectively uh, we all, always do mon2 test and hct chest before starting any biological and uh, we rarely we start biological as a first line therapy uh, exception is only exception is basic disease in some cases of basic disease we we do start them on uh, uh, as a first line therapy any other question or the comments from the panelists great talk partho
My only question is about JAK inhibitors. How do you decide which patients uh, to put on JAK inhibitors for uveitis? Because it's a double-edged kind of, because there are reports of JAK inhibitors inducing uveitis and VKH-like pictures. So I'm kind of a bit confused about JAK inhibitors use in uveitis. So I have used, ma'am, a very interesting question, ma'am. So uh, tofacitinib, uh, uh, we have used in two patients. One patient, the patient was a uh, uh, VKH patient, uh, not responding, exudative RD was not responding to intravenous uh, methylprednisolone, and the patient was started on two, two drug uh, uh, immunosuppressive. So we used uh, tofacitinib, uh, and we, we got uh, the exudative component actually got resolved. So yeah, I, I, I do understand your concern. We, you, we have used only in two cases so far, but we did not uh, observe any inflammation. Okay, thank you. There's, there's a trial going on in uh, GIA, not the uveitis cases, the others. So those trials would come out and suggest to us whether the cases are resistant to adlumab, maybe try the tofacitinib. Huge there, learning are also, curve. there are also concerns that if chances of herpetic infections are higher in tofacitinib to use. True. So we, we need to caution with all these drugs, but as we are learning, we are using more and more cases. Uh, I, I'll be speaking to, uh, about the topic of approach to a patient with to pediatric uveitis. Pediatric uveitis, the uh, etiology is... Uh, quite similar to adults, but some are different like JI, TINU. So you can divide the infection into pediatric uh, infectious and non-infectious uveitis. So the symptoms and signs are, are quite similar to the adults, but the only thing is that in children, the symptoms uh, are, are less reported and they have vision loss by the time they report to you. In children, it can be more aggressive form because the immune system is more robust. The history is shorter, difficult to assist, chronic asymptomatic disease, and for regular checkup, you may require examination under anesthesia or sedation in the OBD to help examine. And slit clamp examination sometimes is difficult. Really, it's a challenge to examine on a slit clamp of a small child. As I mentioned, the chronic disease is more common, the bilateral is more common, and the non-infectious is more common than the infectious one. So the various, we reviewed our data of 148 patients. Ours was mainly, mainly non-infectious. But the AIMS publication showed that the uh, infectious were about 15%. In our series, the majority were interior, but in the AIMS series, about 40% interior, 25% intermediate, and what the remaining were anuveitis or posterior uveitis. The common etiology can be divided into interior, intermediate, and posterior. The GI being the commonest interior, and pars planitis, the intermediate variety. Uh, the classic teaching is toxoplasma. We do not see it as commonly as in the West. Uh, it is important to note that on the first checkup, when you have a synechias, it's very difficult at times to differentiate between an interior and intermediate. So on the first examination, do not label the child as an interior or intermediate, but it may time to, for you to evaluate the patient. A pediatric child, uh, uveitis case, requires a careful review of system. The investigations are based on the history and examination. The blood union and radiology are done. We need to consult the other specialities and it's important to differentiate inferior, uh, infective versus non-infective. All the standard parameters from inflammation of the interior, posterior, vision, and children tend to have a more chance of having glaucoma. So remember the pressure checking in children and small children becomes difficult. The classic teaching is in anterior uveitis, acute red eye, vision loss, but in the child, we sometimes have the asymptomatic white dye. The child has no symptoms, but has a lot of signs. So it's important that we examine all the children who have systemic disease. But at times, the uveitis may present before the, the arthritis. Uh, the uh, uveitis in GI is, is chronic, more in, in the young, independent of the joint involvement. And ANA testing is the one of the most uh, significant tests in AI, which tells us these children are more prone to UVIs. Several publications inform us about the screening, monitoring, and the management of GI. The visual outcomes are better if you have steroid free remission 
because steroid itself will cause cataract and glaucoma. And it requires a team of skilled ophthalmology and rheumatology and informed parents, which are the most important for the best outcome. Very important to educate the parents. Who are at high risk? A young female, ANA positive, and oligoarticular disease. We have a component called the HLA-B27 positive patient with GIA who generally present with an acute red eye like the adults and they are the adolescent males, enthesitis, arthritis with the inflammatory low back. The eye and joint disease do not go parallel to each other. 10% of the patient will have mild disease, 15% may have only one attack and 50% will have moderate while 25% have severe. So all patients whom you see a child, who it is said those a child without synechia, without cataract, without BSK, can be uh, treated with topical steroid. Really, do I find that children get controlled on topical? And majority of times, you have to give systemic immunosuppression. It's important that you prognosticate at the beginning of the uh, treatment what are the risk factors. And the aim is to prevent all complications and avoid surgery and glaucoma. The old reports show us a lot of high range of complications in GIA patients. And the treatment is based on the absence of or improvement of inflammation, the presence of cataract, glaucoma, synechia, band shaped keratopathy, and CME. The pro prognostic factors would be poor initial vision, cataract, macular edema, dense vitreous opacities, and hypotone. So, steroid drops, and at times, systemic steroids are given, but the aim is to start. Uh, immunomodal therapy and methotrexate is the favored one. 70% of the patients would not get control with methotrexate. So if you have uh, patients who have less on less than two drop of steroids, the risk of cataract glaucoma is minimized. But still, if, if you see this review of literature on the nine articles which are reviewed in 2010-11, you find that about 70% of the children will get controlled with only methotrexate. 30% will require additional, which this trial, uh, Adlumab plus Methodistic, uh, helped us in 2017 document the role of uh, biogicals in pediatric UVA. The American College and the uh, European uh, societies have given a lot of guidelines which we can uh, optimize to our use in India. Those children who do not cannot afford biogicals can be given a methotrexate and microfilament. It's important to screen of them, and especially the ones with less than seven years at the higher risk. Now I'll come to the infectious ones. We always were taught torch infection. Toxo is the commonest one, and you can have herpes also. And in infectious, you require a lot of imaging because if you have systemic infections, you require serology and PCR, and sometimes even CSF analysis. The rare ones are the parasitic and the uh, bacterial. TB is, is common in children also, and you can see tubercular choroiditis in children. In, in, in children, it's important that you delineate whether it is an acquired one or it's a congenital one, and does it have extraocular manifestations? This is a patient of classical tuberculosis who had systemic tuberculosis. This is a patient of viral meningitis will having uh, this foster angitis picture. What we have to learn from the rheumatologist is that the mission is remission and avoid steroid as much as possible in children and avoid the creation of cataract and glucose. So in summary, I say avoid steroids, oral or topical, early immunosuppression, long-term treatment, and teamwork is important. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Shomshila would not be presenting. Uh, can the, we show her video, please? Anybody from the... Sir, uh, Sir we, have, we have the BPD of uh, S, uh, Dr. S. Murthy. That's right. Uh, can you play it? Yes, sir. Yes. Shomshila Murthy uh, has sent her video on viral and TV.
can't hear her audio. The technical team. The video is viral uh, uveitis, anterior uveitis. Not this topic, the other one, the one with uh, viral anterior uveitis. So what are the issues in uveitic cataract? It's not really just about performing surgery through a small pupil, but we must also remember that the patient has a disease which we need to take care of. So the first and second aspect that I need to look at is what is the indication of surgery and what's the visual prognosis? So most of the time the indication of surgery is of course to improve vision for the patient but sometimes we might be operating in order for us to have a view of the posterior segment and therefore the visual prognosis must be explained in detail with a lot of chair time taken up to counsel the patient so that they have realistic expectations post-operatively and also to understand that the disease does not end with removal of the cataract but the inflammation needs to be tackled separately. The timing of surgery is always extremely crucial and this should be done in a window when the inflammation is inactive by either even by using pre or perioperative steroids the surgical technique leads a few modifications from our standard cataract surgical techniques and also including the choice whether we can place an intraocular lens or not in pediatric patients less than 10 years or 12 years of age in, uh, placing an intraocular lens is contraindicated post operative regimen is extremely important to control the inflammation and and manage other complications such as glaucoma cystoid macleodema and so on uh, otherwise if left untreated these would lead, lead to loss of so the timing of surgery as i mentioned should be during an inactive time it's very easy to see what is active disease but how do we know that we have waited enough time so it's not just enough to wait by rule of the, by the protocol of waiting for 3 months from the last inflammatory episode but it's more important to look for lack of cells, no cells in the anterior chamber, although flare may persist. And I also look at the appearance of the normalcy of the iris scripts. That's a very good sign for me to realize that if the eye is, is quiet. The actual surgical technique con consists of two important parts. The first is management of the synechia, and the second is the actual capsulorexis and the rest of the FACO procedures. So the synechia can be released just by simple visco dissection in cases where there are very small or thin synechia, but most of the time this is not possible. So we have to use some or the other technique to expand the pupil. So this can be as simple as sphincterotomies using vanas or a, or a micro scissors. We can use collar button devices such as Kublin's hooks uh, as well as iris hooks to keep the pupil dilated throughout the surgery. And we can use eye rings such as the B-hex ring or the Malugin ring. The capsulorexis and the other phaco procedures are pretty much similar to most of the other case, other phaco surgeries that, that we are so used to. So this is a patient who's a 35 year old patient with VKH who had a complicated cataract and a very shallow anterior chamber. Notice that the patient has almost 360 degrees posterior synechae. So after making the side ports, and injecting viscoelastic with the help of a Sinsky, some of the synechae, there's a space selected between the anterior lens capsule and the synechae and the pupil has opened up a little bit and further opening up the pupil simply with the help of Kublin's hooks, doing it very slow, taking care that I do not rip the iris because it's very fragile in young patients and after initiating the rexus with the cystic tome, the rexus is completed with the help of a micro forceps. So after that, most of the time, this is this amount of pupil size is adequate for us to safely perform cataract surgery, especially since the cataract is usually very soft in these young patients. So after hydrodissection, you can notice that the nucleus is, is maybe grade one to two. And by simple, almost like a phaco aspiration or with minimal energy, the entire nucleus can be got out in total. The next part uh, involves a very co a thorough cortical cleanup to ensure that we do not leave any of the inflammatory cortex behind. 
as you can see it's a case with with a very heightened red glow due to VKH or a sunset glow. So a single piece hydrophobic acrylic lens is placed in the bag uh, making sure that the optics are well tucked behind the rexus, the haptics are well tucked behind the rexus and finally at the end of surgery after cleaning up all the viscoelastic I usually give either an injection of intracameral decadron or based on the case sometimes I might give a posterior subtenant injection or an intravitreal time to the cinolone injection. But all of these patients would be patients where I've established that they're not steroid responders. The tech team has the video stopped or it's The tech team is the uh, lecture over or you are going to play the video? I think Dr. Murthy's video is over. Can we, we have the next three speakers who are not available. Can, uh, is Dr. Mayur Morika available? Can he take his talk and share the screen? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, he is there. Yeah. Yeah. Am I audible there? Yeah, you are audible. Okay. Thank you. Welcome to DOS. I'm sharing. Uh, please my go ahead with your talk. Yeah. Dr. Muir Gorica will be speaking on masquerade syndrome. Is my screen shared? Not yet. Are you, can you see my screen? No, not yet. Can you first minimize your photograph? Is it first open it? Have you opened it before? Mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, Mule, yeah. can we come back to you? Yeah. Can we have the next speaker then uh, until you sort it out? Yeah. Yeah. Can you see me now? We, no, not yet. Not screen is not shared, is it? Now is it? Yeah. Now the screen is starting to share. Yeah. Now yeah. it's here. Yeah. You yeah. can make it full screen. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Sorry for the little glitch that we had. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So uh, I always have started all my talks with acknowledgements to my teachers uh, during my residency and also my fellowship. And uh, this talk is a talk on uh, masquerade syndromes. And I see here that most of you are much more experienced than I am in dealing with uveitis. Uh, we all know that masquerade syndromes are disorders that occur with intraocular inflammation and are often misdiagnosed as chronic idiopathic uveitis. The term masquerade syndrome was first used in 1967 to describe a case of conjunctival carcinoma that manifested as chronic conjunctivitis. Today, it is used to describe disorders that simulate chronic uveitis 
because of the nature of the underlying diseases which often have detrimental consequences early diagnosis and prompt treatments are critical when we talk of uh, masquerade syndromes there are a host of syndromes that are in masquerade as uveitis for the purpose of this presentation i'm going to pick up the first neoplastic masquerade that is lymphoma and what we have planned for this presentation is to quickly present the fundus pictures basically of five patients of intraocular lymphoma and try to arrive to five important lessons that i have learned over the last uh, 12 years of practice at uh, bombay hospital so this is the first patient who presented to us in december 2011 a 44 year old lady with cns lymphoma non hodgkins type she had been treated with standard chemotherapy which had caused regression of cns lesions four months later she developed a vitritis and retinochoroidal lesions which evolved relentlessly described uh, despite oral steroids now you can see those lesions which are present they are uh, very typical lesions which can be seen and a clinical diagnosis of intraocular relapse of lymphoma was made post chemotherapy and this was substantiated by radiological investigations by the oncologist the vitreous and the retinochoroidal lesions resolved in 4 weeks with further cycles of chemotherapy causing remission of the disease till a follow up with us for about 3 years so the lesson one is the typical yellowish white lesions which are associated with a leopard skin type of scarring so that was the first lesson for me the second patient that uh, uh, i'm presenting here is uh, who presented to us in november 2018 a 67 year old gentleman with decrease of vision in both eyes since one month the best corrected visual acuity in the left eye was 20 by 80 and less than n36 color vision had been affected he had been on oral prednisolone 20 mg per day you can again see this uh, yellowish white creamy choroidal lesions which are present uh, he had with him a mantu test which was 0 mm a serum ace of 4.20 and interestingly the uh, referring ophthalmologist had done uh, cmv igg titers which were positive Uh, we requested for a pet ct basically because he was a 67 year old gentleman with a new onset uh, uh, uveitis the pet ct suggested a testicular lymphoma and uh, he was diagnosed by the oncologist to have systemic nhl so the second lesson is the patient age and always one should have a very high index of suspicion when encountering uveitis in old patients or in very young patients the third patient uh, was presented to us in september 2014 a 53 year old lady with no other apparent illness presented to us with unilateral decrease of vision since past 9 months due to intense vitritis with a retinochoroidal lesion involving macula seen through a very very hazy media this is all that could be seen you could barely make out the disc which is at the center of the picture and there is all that uh, yellowish lesions there is uh, a lot of him he had been to many ophthalmologists before me and i had referred him also to uh, a few of my teachers for a second opinion she was extensively investigated including new neuroimaging including a vitreous biopsy which was repeated twice and then finally was put on empirical treatment with antibiotics a combination of anti tubercular and anti toxoplasma treatment with oral steroids for a doubtful submacular abscess seen through an excessive media haze the patient was a college pro uh, professor by uh, profession and she had been very specifically coun counseled by us for the atypicality of her uveitis although she was a 53 year old uh, lady a month later she did develop cns symptoms and was admitted and this time on the repeat neuroimaging she showed evolving cerebral lesions uh, which on biopsy showed features of cns lymphoma of the non hodgkin types her uh, antibiotics were stopped and uh, subsequent chemotherapy caused remission of cns lesions and ocular lesions she still follows up in 2020 with us and uh, remains in remission so the lesson 3 is atypical uveitis always have a very high index of suspicion when encountering an atypical uveitis even in the typical uveitis age group and discuss the atypicality with the patient and the relatives 
This is the fourth patient who presented to us in August 2014, a 50-year-old lady with no other apparent illness, presented elsewhere with bilateral asymmetrical decrease of vision since past five months due to multifocal choroiditis and panuveitis, which was investigated and treated elsewhere as VKH disease. Neuroimaging, however, however, was not done. She presented to us. After developing the CNS symptoms, which mandated an ICU admission, where fundus showed typical retinochoroidal lesions, suspicious of ocular lymphoma. So the picture that I have put up is the picture that I have retrieved from the original presentation. By the time she showed us, she was in the ICU with the typical retinochoroidal lesions. Neuroimaging was done, which showed cerebral lesions, which were neurosurgically biopsied and showed CNS lymphoma of the non-Hodgkin's type. She was put on chemotherapy with an initial response, but finally she succumbed to her CNS disease. So the lesson four is atypical uveitis, the role of neuroimaging, and it may be of paramount importance to discuss the need of neuroimaging in all atypical uveitis and request for the same whenever felt necessary and whenever the patient would be able to afford the same. The fifth patient, the last one, is a pretty interesting patient who presented to us in March 2019. A 65-year-old gentleman with both eyes decrease of vision since four months, best corrected visual acuity 20 by 120 in the right eye and the left eye finger counting close to face. Elsewhere, he had received five doses of intravenous methylprednisolone and then oral prednisolone. This is the fundus picture of the left eye and just nasal to this to the disc we see this yellowish white uh, choroidal lesion which seems elevated you can see the retinal vessels which are overlying it appear to be okay we had a very strong suspicion of a lymphoproliferative disorder and requested for a vitreous biopsy which the patient underwent and at the time of vitreous biopsy we even injected intravitreal methotrexate awaiting oncology management uh, this is a picture uh, two weeks after the first intravitreal methotrexate where he achieved a best corrected visual acuity by tw of 20 by 120. Now, interestingly, what happened in this patient is that the neuro neuroimaging did not show any signs of uh, CNS disease. The vitreous biopsy was inconclusive. We even had a CNS CSF analysis for atypical cells that was inconclusive. The oncologists weren't able to start any treatment uh, just on the basis of our clinical suspicion because there was no other uh, evidence of mal malignancy uh, in him. The patient continued on regular follow-up and we continued giving him intravitreal methotrexate, although not in the regimen for uh, an intraocular lymphoma because it was never proved. But we repeatedly counseled him regarding the possibility of lymphoma till about uh, five months later on 12th August 2019, he had some neurological symptoms, had a repeat uh, neuroimaging and uh, was found to ha have a right frontal lobe space occupying lesion, which was then biopsied and showed features suggesting of a high grade uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So the lesson five to us was the role of counseling and we found that it is of paramount importance importance to repeatedly counsel patients and relatives regarding the possibility of a masquerade so that they closely watch for neurological symptoms and can alert us so that we can repeat the neuroimaging whenever required. So the five, summarizing the five lessons, uh, remember the typical morphology of the masquerades. Suspect masquerades were dealing with uveitis in extreme age groups, very young and very old uh, patients. This is the typical age group for masquerades. Discuss an atypical uveitis extensively with the patient and the possibility of a masquerade clearly, even if the age group is typical for uveitis. Discuss and if possible, request for neuroimaging in all atypical uveitis, even if the age group is typical for uveitis. And finally, discuss and counsel the possibility of a masquerade, even if it has been ruled out by neuroimaging, vitreous biopsy and lumbar puncture, especially in the typical age group. With this, I would like to conclude the presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayur. So if, you, if we suspect a patient of uh, lymphoma, should we first get a neuroimaging done and then the uh, TAP and the LP? 
uh i would first I, in fact in our setup we immediately involve the neurologist and the oncologist both and then we tend to do the neuro imaging and the cf tap it both it's both together because the patient gets admitted thank you so dr partho any comment i'm mm -hmm. waiting for a comment from partho yeah you know mayur that uh, sometimes yeah. even if you have high index of suspicion no it uh, always uh, does not work out so yeah. it happened with us so can we have the next speaker dr amitabh kumar dr amitabh can you uh, will be speaking on vkh welcome to dos doctor good afternoon thank you dos and dr amit for giving me this opportunity and uh, So I will be speaking on uh, Wolff-Coy and Aguinaldo disease, and as we know by definition, it's a bilateral granulomatous pan-uveitis, often asymmetrical. And this is one of my patients with a pan-uveitis with an exudative retinal detachment in the right eye, and this is in the left eye. And we, we did an angiography which revealed early pinpoint leaks with late pooling, as we see the right eye, and a similar picture in the left eye. We Uh, we went ahead with a OCT scan, and the swept shows OCT showed multiple pockets of SRF with subretinal uh, fibrin. Uh, so Amitabh, can you uh, sorry, Dr. Amitabh, yeah. can you uh, make your screen full? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, is it visible now? Yeah, no, now it's fine. Yeah. yeah. So we treated this patient with uh, topical steroids and three doses of intravenous methylprednisolone with uh, oral steroids and azathioprine. And this is the OCT pre-treatment and post-treatment where you see the uh, 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 fluid has resolved. She had uh, three or four recurrences in between, and this is one of the recurrences where she had exudated with a uh, retinal detachment again in the max posterior pole in both the eyes. So in view of the recurrences, she was put on triple agent immunosuppression in the form of oral steroids, azathioprine, and cyclosporine. And this is at the end of nine months. So VKH, there are two clinical findings which are highly specific to VKH are an exudative rectal detachment in the acute phase and a sunset glow fundus in the chronic phase. Most of the reactivations are in the anterior segment, but there are, there are proofs and evidence available where the posterior segment also might uh, could, could get involved even if there's just an anterior segment involvement. And according to this study, uh, the late uh, exudative rectal detachments, uh, they are limited to the submacular area. A study done at Chankar Nitralia Chennai revealed that uh, there was a female pre uh, predominant and most of the cases were probable leakage and they responded well to azathioprine and steroids. Whereas in the Chinese population, the extraocular signs and symptoms were as high as 85%. If we look into the genetics of leakage, there's an HLA association where HLA-DQ1 seems to be protective, whereas HLA-DQ4 carriers have a higher risk of uh, leakage. They also have raised intraocular levels of IL-6, IL-8, and interferon gamma. Now, the investigative tools available with us are fluorescent angiography, intersigning green angiography, ultrasonography, OCTA, UBM, and off-late OCTA. Uh, if we see the angiography, uh, if there is an absence of early pinpoint peripapillary hyperfluorescent on, fluor on uh, fluorescent, this is a poor prognostic factor. ICG, if we see in the acute phase, uh, there's, uh, th there are signs of choroidal perfusion delay. You can see hypofluorescent choroidal vessels. Uh, the hypofluorescent dark dots, which are most common and most relevant for follow-up, they could be this hypofluorescent choroidal folds. And in the latest stages of the fume blade choroidal hypofluorescence or the starry sky pattern. The indesign is being in geography may reveal an activity despite no clinical or fluorescent in geographic findings. So this is a, an, a good tool, not only for diagnosis, but also for follow-up of these patients. Now, there are uh, uh, reports of uh, choroidal involvement in anterior recurrence of Wolff-Coy and Argy Harada disease. And you see multiple HDDs on ICG. This is before treatment, and this is after treatment. 
ICT can also differentiate between choroidal scars and active lesions to guide us uh, to, uh, uh, regarding the, the treatment of these patients. And here you see these, uh, this is before treatment where these macular HDGs are there, which have resolved after treatment, whereas the peripheral ones have uh, remained. So they are the choroidal scars. A non-investigative, uh, non-invasive investigative tool available with us is the optical coherence tomography, where the, the typical features are subretinal membranous structures with hyperreflective dots, RPE folds, and RDs. So now we are uh, able to manage the, uh, the, the image, the choroid, and the choroidal biomarkers are uh, with the enhanced depth uh, OCT, especially SS OCT, which has got a much better resolution, and choroidal granulomas and EDI OCT, uh, they are hyperreflective, homogeneous round lesions with well-defined margins. And here you see the active stage where there's a choroidal thickness, and there's a clear-cut demarcation between the choroid and the sclera, and this is after treatment. OCT can also also help us differentiate between a VKH and an acute CSCR. A VKH will have fluctuations of ILM, RP folds, the subretinal septae, whereas uh, an acute CSCR will have PD and RPE bulge. In a recurrent uh, uh, anterior uveitis attack in VKH, the choroidal vascularity index decreases and the choroidal thickness increases in these patients. So this is another evidence uh, that choroid is affected during recurrent anterior uveitis and chronic VKH. And this is the choroidal vascularity index, which is actually a ratio of the liminal area divided by the total choroidal area. In the convalescent VKH, there's choroidal atrophy and loss of choroidal capillaries. And the subfoveal choroidal thickness correlates with the visual acuity. And here you see these are, this is the, the red arrows. They are the choroidal capillaries, the satellite layer, and the halus layer and the convalescent stage where there's loss of choroid capillary. Or, or another investigative tool available is the OCTA, and they have found massive impaired perfusion in the satellite layer on OCTA. We can also see areas of uh, flow deficits in the, uh, in, at the, at the choroid capillaries, which have resolved after uh, treatment, and there's not much of a signal loss. OCTA can also distinguish between an acute VKH and acute CSR, so in acute VKH, we'll see these uh, uh, dark dots, and there's not much of uh, signal loss. Whereas in CSR, there'll be more of a mottled dark appearance with loss of signal, and these dark dots correspond to the PED. Uh, autofluorescence is another uh, investigative tool available where, where after resolution RD, if the patient has had a delayed treatment, then there'll be a widespread hypoautofluorescence, which concentrates centripetally with time. And this is more evident with the near infrared autofluorescence. So this is the near infrared autofluorescence, and this is the blue light autofluorescence. As far as the treatment is concerned, uh, the standard of therapy is early and sustained treatment with steroids and immunosuppressive therapy. High dose IV pulse cutting steroids are beneficial. Whereas another report says that the route of administration does not have much effect on the outcome of the treatment. Immunosuppressive therapy, if added as a first line therapy, uh, has got a definite superior visual outcome as compared to a steroid as a monotherapy or with delayed addition of IMT. The most important thing is these, uh, this, this treatment needs to be continued for at least six months for the treatment of acute VKH. The local therapies available are intravitreal triamcinolone, dexamethasone, but fluocinolone as it's night has not been very promising. Recalcitrant traces uh, uh, might require rituximab. So this is uh, uh, a case support on a young patient uh, where he had uh, ocular and sensorineural sensor auditory remissions after rituximab. Uh, Anti-TNF, adalimumab uh, fared well as compared to infliximab. So in our part of the world, it's mainly a probable VKH. They need an early diagnosis and initiation of appropriate therapy for a decreased duration of time. Uh, recurrences are mainly anterior, but even then the patients should be imaged because the posterior segment also might involve, because that will guide us to uh, the treatment to be given to these patients, and they need a long-term follow-up. Thank you for our patient care. Thank you, Dr. Uh, I have a small question. Uh, do you taper the immunosuppressive in the end, or you stop it suddenly? How do you uh, plan the treatment for patients who go into remission? Um, uh, well, the, the immunosuppress uh, immunosuppressors, normally uh, we would... Uh, being a tapering dose, obviously, because when in the early stages, when it is acute, say it will be a higher dose, and we, we gradually taper the dose, and it would also depend upon how the patient has responded to the immunosuppressors and how the blood parameters are, as to how well they have tolerated the medication. 
the other thing is that you have all the tools available icg oct enhanced depth oct and auto flow sense which would be the most sensitive indicator in remission like how do i know if if i have to do one of these tests i'll say yes the patient has gone into remission among these four well i would prefer a non invasive uh, tool for uh, detecting uh, whether he would need the further uh, whether we need to continue the uh, treatment for that patient well but icg is one tool which has been uh, the gold standard kind of a thing where they can they can actually uh, guide us to uh, the treatment as to how long we need to continue this patient for medication because even if there's no endeavor uh, even if there's no clinical activity or activity on angiography icg can still pick up uh, the posterior segment involvement thank you dr mita thank you dr reema you do dr reema is available no dr reema okay. we go to the last talk by dr lokesh jain who will be speaking on ocular changes in sn dr lokesh could you unmute yourself uh, yes sir thank i'll just take a minute sir to Yeah. Please go ahead. Share your slides. Yes, sir. Get on. Hmm. Uh, you muted yourself again. You need to unmute your uh, uh, video and your this thing, and you need to share your screen. Uh, Dr. Rima is here. Dr. Rima had a question. By the time Dr. Lokesh starts, what is your view on the various? Uh, Share me. Yeah, Dr. Amit. In VKH, what is the most sensitive? ICG, OCT, angio, or uh, or enhanced depth? What would you take as the uh, final test for a remission in VKH? Or a remission? If I'm treating a patient of VKH and I want to stop the treatment, what is the sensitive indicator? Uh, uh, ICG, uh, FA, or uh, OCT, or uh, enhanced depth OCT. What would I take as a parameter to stop the treatment in VKH? For the non-invasive, I would do EDI OCT. Yeah. And if uh, if uh, required, I would go for an ICG. But most of so the time, the EDI OCT does the job. What what parameters you check the thickness or what what do you check on a EDI? Just the choroidal thickness. So it comes down how much like from the beginning to the end how much difference do you find in the? It comes down to normal. We keep monitoring. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lokesh. Can you share your screen? You can unmute yourself, Dr. Lokesh. Dr. Lakesh, please go ahead. Share your screen. Uh, sir, I'm, I'm I'm just taking a minute. I'm not able to share. It. No hurry, no hurry. Yeah. You need to open your slides uh, first before you come on the, and then you uh, make it uh, full size. Okay, sir. Please open it. I'm just opening. Yeah. Uh, minimize your zoom. Uh, open the slides and then uh, open the zoom. Yeah. Would the tech team like to give some help? आपकी पूरी स्क्रीन शेयर हो जाएगी ठीक है मतलब सब कुछ देगा पर आपके फोन में Hmm. Till the time, Doctor Lokesh opens his slides. Any questions from the panelists? Would like to share, ask any questions, or share some thoughts? Hello. 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 हेलो लोकेश सर मेरा यूज कर लो माइक्रोसॉफ्ट अकाउंट है सर 
लोकेश सर आपको शेयर स्क्रीन वाला बटन दिख रहा है हाँ सर वो दिख रहा है पर इसके अंदर प्रेजेंटेशन वहां से लोड नहीं हो पा रही ओके तो ऐसा हो ना तो पहले प्रेजेंटेशन ऑन कर दो और मिनिमाइज कर दो अच्छा और उस, उसके बाद आप जूम पे आओ और फिर शेयर स्क्रीन करो तो हो जाएगा डॉक्टर मयूर आर यू ऑनलाइन कैन वी हैव ऑल दी पैनलिस्ट अनम्यूटेड सो वी कुड डिस्कस समथिंग टू टाइम टू लोकेश कम्स ऑन डॉक्टर अमिताभ and in case i mean this is the normal protocol the, the yeah. uh, in, a, in a taping dose of oral steroids and a taping dose of azathioprine as well uh, there are yeah. reports of use of mycophenolate uh, also uh, but i mm. think uh, uh, in our experience we have found azathioprine if the patient tolerates it well then azathioprine to be working pretty well what are the dosages uh, you use for azathioprine Is a type of normally, which are normal adults, we put them on uh, 50 milligram three times a day, and depending upon the response, we taper it. So you start, uh, you start with full dose, or you gradually taper for, for the general okay. ophthalmologist. I always want to educate them, like you, what parameters you start with for the general ophthalmologist. What should they do before starting? No, uh, other than the baseline test, the most important ones for monitoring also are to do the total uh, counts and the that is the total count, the platelet count, and also the liver function test and mainly the transamine users because that's what uh, really we are looking for. Um, and uh, so we start with the full dose and then taper it depending upon the response. You taper it after six months, one year. What is your criteria for VK? So that will depend upon the patient's uh, response to the treatment. But probably uh, in most of the cases, if it has been picked up early, then they would need a full dose of oral steroids, a full dose of azathioprine, uh, but may not require uh, such a high dose of uh, azathioprine for six months or so. Probably say around two months or three times a day, and then you taper it around two times a day for uh, two months or so, and then taper it down again for around once a day. Or so. And if required, probably half a day, uh, half half tablet per day. Uh, till till you feel there's some remission. So, a question to all the panelists: What is your experience of the side effects of methotrexate, azathioprine, and MMF? So we could just for the audience uh, just uh, give them one side effect common which we see in all, or all three. If you could, Doctor Amita, could you start and say? I, I think deranged liver functions are pretty common. I have not seen many patients of uh, uh, going into uh, uh, bone marrow suppression. Uh, I think the commonest side effect with uh, most of these is uh, the deranged liver function, out of which I think mycophenolate is a relatively safe uh, medication. Uh, Dr. Mayur, would you like to uh, comment? What are your experiences? Various drug side effects. Are uh, other panelists online? Dr. Reema, Dr. Padmamali, Dr. Partho. They all muted. Yeah, Dr. Amit. Yeah, uh, a relative side effect which you see with these three drugs, which uh, the comprehensive ophthalmologist should know about the one-one side effect of three common drugs we use: methotrexate, mycophenolate, and uh, azathioprine. Azathioprine—it's uh, a by and large very safe drug, and the only thing that we need to monitor are the counts. And the uh, liver function test, especially the SGOT and PT, SGPT. So, if you see the uh, counts going down or the uh, hemoglobin fluctuating, one needs to be careful. Otherwise, all good. One more thing: I think the myelosuppression. One should be uh, aware of that. The myelosuppression with azathioprine. So sometimes it can be very serious. So. we usually advise the patient to monitor the blood count for uh, every 2 weeks for uh, at least for initial 2 3 2 months and then we ask them to monitor it every month every month 
I think we have Dr. Lokesh coming through, through his mobile. Dr. Lokesh, welcome. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Sorry for the delay, sir. No problem. You need to put the slides on and make your phone horizontal. Yes, sir. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairpersons and my dear please. I'm speaking on the topic of ocular manifestation of SLE. Uh, systemic erythematous is an autoimmune disease characterized by the production of numerous autoantibodies. SLE is not organ specific and can affect multiple organ systems. Wide distribution of system involvement is because the majority of autoantibodies are targeted against components of cell nuclei. Arthritis, glomerulonephritis, and dermatitis are primary clinical manifestations. However, membranoidic and neurological dispensers are also common. Ocular movement is moderately common in SLD and can be vision threatening. Ocular movement may precede systemic uh, systems. It may vary from patient to patient and can correlate to the system disease activity. It may occur up to one third of the patients. Lupus arithmetic was first described and distinguished from lupus vulgaris by Casanova and Charity in 1833. Skin lesions were first reported by Haber in 1845. Kapuski also in 1872 reported it as a systemic illness with potentially life threatening consequences. Uh, ocular lesion was first described by Bagamister in 1929, who described the classical retinal findings of cotton wool agitates, irregular white pitches, long retinal grains, and disc hyperemia. Salman and Wool conducted surgical examination of eyes of patients with SLE in 1933 and found choroiditis and subretinal exudations. The clinical criteria uh, of SLE are diverse. American Medical Society has established relevant diagnostic criteria for SLE. Diagnosis of SLE can be made when four of these criteria are met. However, a clinical diagnosis may be made even when less than four criteria are met. A clashing of severely consists of malabash, discoidash, photosensitivity, oral ulcers, neuro, uh, erosive, uh, non erosive arthritis, pulveritis or pericarditis, global arthritis, seizures, hematological disorders, immunological disorders, and positive ANA tests. It is not caused by any medication. Uh, okay, coming to the ocular manifestation SLE, SLE can involve eye and anesthesia. It should be considered in the deficient diagnosis of mucotonic disease, sclerosis and episcleritis, keratoconin sicca, keratopathy, uveitis, retinal involvements, and papillitis and neurothermal diseases. Eyelids may manifest the inflammatory and scaly lesions of discoid lupus arthritis. Keratoconin sicca occurs in approximately 20% of the patients and is distributed from sicca complex seen in other connective tissue disorders. Uh, Scleritis and epilepsy are frequently associated with SLE. Anger close of glaucoma secondary to uvular vision may be the initial manifestation of SLE. The most recognized uh, ocular vision is lupus retinopathy. Visual loss for lupus retinopathy is viewed as an important index of disease severity. The lesions of lupus retinopathy are varied in appearance, but most are believed to arise from retinal vascularities. Fundus findings may be vascularities, vasoclusion, occlusion, which might be a, a microvascular occlusion, arterial occlusion, or venous occlusion. Visual disruption, uh, ischemic sucral or hypertensive sucral. Uh, as you know, SLE is a multi common multi system disorder. However, retinal vasculitis as a primary manifestation of SLE is uncommon, accounting for only 4% of retinal vasculitis. The postulative mechanism appears to be vasoclusion of the retinal arteries by thrombosis with resultant ischemia. Orthopathy in SLE is rare, with a prevalence of around 1%. Diagnosis of SLE can be made on the basis of clinical and laboratory findings. Reduction of ANA is a good screening test. Occasionally, ocular manifestation may precede systemic findings. Any young patient with cotton wool spots or hemorrhage should be referred to the rheumatologist or physician. Treatment studies include NSIDs, which is mostly for the arthritis or psoriasis, hydroglycolin for the skin lesions, systemic corticosteroids, immune therapy, uh, therapy and targeted the bulging therapies is mostly for the systemic uh, involvement. Treatment of ocular disease in SLA is based on the systemic therapy, pan-retinal focal for neuroclonization sequel, and anti therapy 
for cystic macular edema, cradle nerve infection, and other affected cases. I like to present a case of 24-year female who presented to us with a chief complaint of sudden diminution of vision in both eyes from last three months. She gave a history of hair fall for last three months, and she also gave a history of suffering from chicken pox. Chicken pox. On examination, her best clear visual acuity was contrary fingers at 2.5 meters in the right eye, and contrary fingers at half meters in the left eye. The intraocular pressure was around 60 mm Hg in both eyes. The anterior segment examination was in the normal limits. Uh, I'll show the fundus photograph uh, on this patient. Uh, she had multiple cotton wool spots around the posterior pole and uh, mid periphery. Arteries look spill rose, and uh, even we can see there is a this looks spill. An optical coronal tomography was done, which is largely mm -hmm. normal. Mm -hmm. There is no trace of any edema or any other. Mm -hmm. So, job registration, job registration. Her uh, flash VP. Uh, was done, which was uh, flat in both the eyes. Her central visual fields were markedly constricted. A fundus fluorescence angiography was done. Uh, FFA in the both eyes shows total loss of capillaries, except some capillaries at the peripapillary region. Uh, the mild staining was noted around some vessels. Complete physical examination was done. Uh, patient gave history of hyperpigmentation in the scalp, disfigurement, hair loss. She also had a history of giddiness and nausea. Uh, she had also had a weight loss and loss of appetite. The past history of uh, CSM was also present. There is no positive history of joint pain, tuberculosis, malaria, or loss of consciousness. Her mention history was also normal. Patient was advised blood investigations, uh, CBC, peripheral smear, ANA remitted factor, chest X ray, and other tests were done. Her peripheral blood smear revealed hypochromia, anastosis, and polyphenicity. Microsize immediately were also present. Uh, hemoglobin was around 9 mg per decision, and ESR was uh, increased, it was around 57 mm. The uh, antinuclear antibody assay was positive. Based on these findings, we made a provisional clinical analysis of SME and started intravenous mineral pregnancy, 1 gram per day for 3 days, followed by oral steroids, 1 mg per kg body weight in tapping doses. There was, though there was no improvement in my, my visual acuity despite this treatment in both eyes, but during the last uh, 6 months follow-up, in which she received oral steroid on 5 mg per day, she did not have any other complication. Our visual equity and fundus finding remain as before. In summary, I would like to say that adrenal occlusion is a rare form of lupus retinopathy characterized by the occlusion of the central retinal artery, causing widespread retinal ischemia and severe permanent visual loss. Sudden visual loss with central retinal artery occlusion in young patients should prompt the clinician to include SLE and other collagen diseases in the list of differential diagnoses. Severe retinal ischemia from either arterial or venous occlusion may result in retinal neuroscalization. The complication of severe ischemia, such as vitreous hemorrhage, uh, traction and detachment and secondary neuroscular or hemorrhagic glaucoma are threatening. Though uh, SLE has a myriad of clinical uh, manifestations, it may be a presenting sign of systemic disease. Their presence can be a sign or marker of disease activity. Presence of retinopathy and cardiopathy are poor prognostic signs. A close communication between ophthalmologists and urologists is critical in effective management. Thank you for your patient training. Thank you, Dr. Lokesh, yes, for an interesting case. Thank you, sir. Uh, how, uh, how many of SLE patients would present to the ophthalmologist? This was an interesting case you presented. Would present to the ophthalmologist? Less than 1%? Yes, sir. Maybe. Very less patients, sir. Now. But nowadays, uh, we do, uh, I do get some patients who are on uh, this therapy for fundus checkup. So I just wanted to highlight to the audience is that uh, in SLE, we do a ANA, which by immunofluorescence gives a better uh, result. And you can be ANA negative at SLE. You may have a, just a anti-phospholipid antibody and presenting as a vascular block. So combined CRVO, CRAO of the young can also be. So an APLA test is also uh, may be positive. So I have one case who presented to me with uh, APLA positive vascular block, but came in a positive after two years. So the test may become positive later than the disease. Okay. Dr. Partho, are you uh, online? Sorry, sir. I, I just missed your this thing, sir. Yeah. So my question is, uh, we've discussed this before. How many of SLE would present to the ophthalmologist first before it's diagnosed? Or we generally get diagnosed cases of SLE who have ocular complex? 
very very rarely sir very rarely we see but uh, if you have a good collaboration with your rheumatologist no you you can uh, they can refer refer to you i remember seeing a patient of uh, uh, sle a uh, 16 year old girl who was referred uh, with with a diagnosis of viral retinitis because that girl had history of fever joint pain and the fundus they suspected retinitis because it was pushner flecans so sometimes this kind of uh, uh, picture can mimic viral retinopathy and often because the sign and symptoms uh, uh, of joint pain fever Uh, goes in favor of this kind of no so sometimes it is misdiagnosed so this is a very rare uh, rare uh, case scenario but should be kept in mind true true uh, i think we are coming to the end of the session uh, thank you all the panelists and all the speakers being part of a excellent session we learned from each other looking forward to more interaction i'll thank you like the dos executive for giving us opportunity to do this uvi test We thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Hello. The leave me because I'm ready. Leave Kalu. Ah, hello. नेक्स्ट क्या है इसमें यूविया वाले में जब जाऊंगा तब ले आऊंगा
Hi. Are we are we in the correct one, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I just wanted to confirm that. No, I couldn't hear any audio, so I wasn't sure. Yeah, even I couldn't hear. Yeah. Uh, but I think only two of us are there, so they will join in. All right. Cool. What's up? Nothing much. How are things at your end? Good, yeah. It's half a day still. So I'm done with my hospital, but I'm still at the hospital doing this and then going back, pushing off. Cool. What's up with you? Nothing much. It's the same. I'm still at work. Yeah, but how is it? Has it picked up or anything? Uh, cases are picked up. Work is still the same. <laughs> yeah, true, actually. It's really better than before. Yeah, it's, it's definitely better than before. I'm just trying to see who all have the still a little confused whether you and I are together. Yeah, yeah, we are. We are no? Yeah, in the same session. Yes. The new idea to clinics. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yet to join, we're starting at three, right? Yeah, I was just wondering whether whatever they had given, no, so I was not really sure whether it's a Zoom link or what. So I thought that I'll just log in 10 minutes prior and see that how do we share the presentations and stuff like that. But yeah, I guess. Just one second, I have a patient, I'll just uh... yeah, 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 carry on. I'll just Are we running a little late, is it? I have no idea. It's three o'clock, but no one has joined. Three to four thirty or four o'clock? Three to four thirty. Sharon Puja, who else is there? You me. Arvind Molia. Okay. No idea. We just had uh, uh, my husband. Right. I think so. Okay, mm -hmm. why is that done? What? Sorry, what? Say that again. No, I'll you tell you later. I was just saying that uh, we just had, you know, my husband just had uh, COVID. Out of it? Yeah, he's fine now, out of it. But went through all that COVID ruckus, yeah. Yeah, same here. Achha, oh. Husband, father-in-law, dad. And uh, he yeah, lost five kidneys. I said, at least I should get it. <laughs> if that's, that's the good point of it. <laughs> Good side effect. <laughs> Dr. Natasha? Yes. Oh, hi. How are you? 
Hi, Fanny. Hi. Okay. Because in agenda, I can't see it. Halji is correct, right? Halji is correct. Halji is correct. You are, you are at the correct uh, place. <laughs> Thank you. So, I will join in a few minutes. Okay, sure. I seriously wonder, but nowadays, if anyone else logs in to the whole thing besides the speakers, and so <laughs> I, logging in. yeah, do because I don't do it for any other webinars where I'm not participating. No, I have been logging in. In fact, uh, it's good to get in touch with people just like that, and then you know, yeah, you get in touch with them. It's like you know, we are there, they're talking, and sadly, talking, sir. Bye. So like I didn't attend a single session of Keracon also. I don't know. I just don't get Until it. You're lying. No, I'm not lying. <laughs> I I got into that oops session, heard it for 10 to 15 minutes and then got out of it. So I couldn't even write, you know, on Cornea interest group, it was good or bad. I really don't know whether it was good or bad or like, you know. Actually, these are all also good meetings, you know, because wherever I participate, I really like those. But uh, what happens is three, four hours continuously on the computer, along with my uh, binge watching, <laughs> gives me so much of headache. I have like, I am just right now looking for, uh, there's this uh, Housewives of Beverly Hills. Okay, there's only two seasons available on Netflix and I'm desperately searching for the other seasons. Nowadays, I like all that more. <laughs> huh, Mr. Ashok? You are live. Yeah. So, Natasha, just uh, take over and uh, start calling the speakers, everything. And one by one, we will start the process. Sure, sir. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I... Um... Hope everyone is in good health and in great spirits. Uh, and uh, we are uh, jumping back and shifting gears into our clinical practice. So this is a good way of virtually meeting everyone. Um, so today we'll be uh, discussing about the new normal. The new normal is the new word that uh, we're getting used to. So um, uh, the intention of this small uh, group discussion is uh, to just appraise ourselves and have a good deliberation of what are we doing in this new normal. Um, we'll start, is Sharon around? I'll just call her Natasha. I think uh, she might be with a patient. I'll just call her. Okay, we can start with, otherwise your talk, Natasha, just to say. Sure, yeah, yeah. sure certainly, we can do that. So. Um, uh, I'll be the opening batsman and uh, we will be discussing about the new normal and the new idea. Um, I'll share my screen now. Is it, is it visible? Yes, Natasha. Okay, great. Uh, so without uh, further ado, um, we'll start with the first talk. Uh, so I'll be speaking on um, what is the new idea to the clinics and this new normal um, agenda. And I have no financial interests to disclose. Uh, so why are we talking about this new idea or the new normal? It's simply because these are the new ideas that help us keep evolving. Irrespective of what is our stimulus for evolution, we are still evolving. I mean, so much so that that imagine the dry eye disease that was earlier classified based on Shermer's and T-Butt into aqueous deficient and evaporated dry eye is is now uh, is into a multimodal uh, you know classification. And there's so much into dry eye spectrum that we understand. And it's simply because we have evolved into our understanding of dry eye disease. So much so that imagine it takes 43 words to define, define dry eye disease. It's almost as big as a short note. 
but but i mean with all this evolution are we justifying our evolution is because i mean imagine we are treating dryer disease still with lubricants are we really justified in our evolution when we talk of of treating this let me bring this into perspective so if if a person has got a radius and ulnar fracture would you want to just put a cast or a mal arm over it or or would you want to do a k wiring uh, in in this case i mean this is exactly what lubricants are doing they are simply a cast on a fracture they are not they are so detached from actually treating the cause for the dry eye disease and and uh, uh, further adding into this pers perspective because we are talking of this new normal uh, look at the new normal of covid times where we are staying at home we are working from home our screen times have increased there are online classes for kids now and this is obviously causing more and more evaporated dry eye disease to increase so the incidence has significantly increased so much so that that it is as high as 73% in some studies now ao also reports that there is increase in the incidence of dry eye disease i did a small ex exercise before this presentation after lockdown i looked at all the patients who were coming uh, to us and predominantly looked at patients on an average who had dry eye like symptoms who had presented with those kind of symptoms and it's shocking to see that almost 52 52 patients uh, of 80 patients that i saw on an average in a day had a uh, dry eye disease like symptoms so so are we really justified in understanding this now why is this why is there so much discrepancy simply because our diagnostics are challenging i mean look at it if we had to step wise do a, a evaluation of a dry eye patient in the clinic this is how we would do it in a step wise manner now in this entire spectrum how much time are we really spending on understanding the kind of dry eye disease or understanding what is happening in the tear film level or at the biomarker level we do not have those kind of diagnostics to understand this so so i mean look at this the although the weightage of the pathophysiology or the uh, the mechanism for dry eye disease or understanding of dry eye disease is predominantly based on the tear film composition but what are we actually imaging here our our understanding is by the non invasive diagnostic methods or by clinical test no doubt they are robust but we need to do more this is where the concept of new idea comes in so understanding this we have we have evolved in understanding how our dry eye diseases it's just not about shermers and tiber we have also understood how osmolarity affects the severity of dry eye disease or that there is desiccation on the ocular surface or there's increased apoptosis and corneal autophagy that happens in in uh, dry eye disease so from understanding of all of this we have also understood that uh, there is increased osmolarity there's increased desiccation and then there is increased apoptosis um so so in the in the uh, in the dry eye disease so how this how does this act in the mechanism is it causes increased ocular surface inflammation now there is increased um, uh, reactive oxygen species there is oxidative stress and if this is not cleaned up because of the increased apoptosis we have more debris on the ocular surface this causes further increase in inflammation and more desiccation and more ocular surface inflammation this is set into a forward feed loop mechanism and there's nothing that break, that's breaking it how are we currently treating it is by what is fda approved is cyclosporin and by lubricants how are we justified in treating this mechanism so how do we actually manage this is probably we have to look at the key mechanisms of dry eye disease per se let's go to the basics we know that there is inflammation we know there is hyperosmolarity we know there is apoptosis also furthermore let's look at what happens in post lasik which also contributes to a significant population of uh, dry eye disease we know that there is decreased sensitivity which causes inflammation because of decreased nerve stimulation there is increased hyperosmolarity because of decreased tear secretion again because of decreased nerve stimulation further there is ocular surface damage and more apoptosis and more uh, which causes further dry eye like symptoms now in this entire understanding of the key mechanisms we should be treating these factors how do we treat it is by probably immunomodulation for inflammation hyperosmolarity can be treated by osmoprotective agents and uh, uh, autophagy induction to clear off all the debris that is there on the ocular surface to understand this we have got actually different class of drugs that basically treat all of this so how do we you know 
really be mindful of treating or selecting our medications in dry eye disease. Now, there's a very good stepwise method that the DUCE2 classification has brought out. Step one, as by DUCE2, is to give simple uh, ocular lubricants, depending on which type of dry eye it is. But step two is actually the uh, step where we start giving prescription drugs in terms of tetracyclines or immunomodulators or topical corticosteroids or cyclosporin for that matter. Now, this is the, it is basically a step two or step three that we are treating inflammation, apoptosis and hyperosmolarity. So instead of gi not giving prescription drugs, can we choose an ocular lubricant which is able to address inflammation, apoptosis and hyperosmolarity? This is where the concept of new idea comes in and a need for a smarter lubricant comes in. So this has been published by uh, Professor Rohit Shetty and Sharon. Um, and what they have discussed is, is uh, the use of trehalose. Now it is uh, along with uh, sodium hyaluronate, it is able to uh, control inflammation, apoptosis and hyperosmolarity. You know, this is done in cell lines. If you see these images, we know that we can clearly see morphologically when trehalose is put on desiccated cells, the cell morphology is much better as opposed to the untreated cells which are seen on the top right corner. So essentially, there is a proof that we can treat inflammation, apoptosis and uh, inflammation basically just by choosing the right lubricant. We have also published this, uh, in, this was a, a part of my PhD work, uh, where we saw that oxidative stress is also, or the autophagy, uh, autophagy is also responsible for um, certain uh, etiological uh, factors in keratoconus and it may be altered autophagy in keratoconus. This, so uh, this also worked, uh, won the Colonel Rangachari Award. Um, this work uh, predominantly won. But what is more gratifying is that this work translated into something that uh, we're so uh, familiar with and we're so proud of with the uh, Atmanirbhar um, Abhyan, where this new idea translated into an actual medication that is commercially available. The use of trehalos um, along with sodium hyaluronate, a simple lubricant that, that is able to address a huge subset of our population addressing uh, osmolarity, uh, apoptosis, as well as inflammation, just by the choice of right lubricant. So this new idea is what um, has uh, translated our uh, work and it is uh, very, very gratifying to see it. And this work would not have been possible without these incredible human beings and very brilliant scientists and clinicians who have made this happen. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, uh, Natasha. Nice presentation and uh, nice overview into the whole journey. Uh, anybody has any questions? Uh, we don't see anything on the chat box, but uh, uh, if you have any questions on uh, how much, how longer would you advise uh, uh, this uh, drops? That's one question. The second question I would like to ask you is, as you mentioned that this is a disaccharide sugar, do you think that it would change the ocular flora uh, in an in a immunocompromised patient or a diabetic patient? Because, uh, because we need to understand that a uh, lot of things thrive on sugar. Is it the same sugar as uh, we say, or is it a different type of sugar? Because this is also a sugar-based uh, substance. You know, how do you, how do you, uh, you know, is there a patient who would, you, would you say that I would not want to put on this patient? That's a brilliant question, a very clinical, uh, clinically relevant question, sir. Um, uh, you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a disaccharide uh, and it's a sugar, but um, so this is going to cause certain amount of hydration in the epithelial cells, which which may loosen up the um, hemidesmosome. So in especially in cases like uh, uh, diabetics who may be prone to developing corneal infections um, with open wounds and when delayed wound healing, I would not recommend uh, using a disaccharide in, in such a case. Um, also, in uh, I would be very wary of using this in, uh, in patients of... Um, keratitis, um, uh, in case of microbial keratitis, or in terms of fungal keratitis. Um, that would be my take. So you're mute, sir. I can't hear you. Okay. In these cases, a simple sodium hyaluronate would do the uh, best. Okay, Sharon is here. She still has the background of Keracon. Uh, 
And uh, Sharon, would you like to present yes. now? Yes. Uh, give me one minute. So I think uh, in that way, you covered up everything. Uh, basically, we just have to be, it works wonders. Like I like the last slide where you said that it does the work of three things, an anti-inflammatory, a lubricant, and uh, anti-itch factor. Sure. All the three together. So instead of multiply, multiple giving drops, one thing can take care of this. So that is how it works like a three-in-one. I Sita, have, a, you have question. a question. Yeah. Uh, so basically, I want to ask that when will you, uh, I mean, like which patients will you prefer trihalose, which patients will you prefer cyclosporin or do you want to give both because uh, both of them have slightly different actions? So if how, how will you go about it when we are treating patients in clinics? Okay. If you're looking at a mild form of inflammation, uh, Sheetal, without a lot of changes on your lids, you know, a lid plays a very important role for me, especially lid delangiectasias and other things. The MMP9 activity is all driven by indirect measure is on your lid. You know, those glands block, cap glands, and those are all heavy inflamed one. In these, just uh, trehalose would not work. This you would need a cyclosporin with trehalose. But when you see 60 to 70% of your patient walk into your clinic and the lids are okay, mild mybumin, you can just query mybumin, mybumin gland inflammation, then this would work well, one. Two, Children with allergy, you know, uh, where you would, you know, in India, if you just use them one, once, a, once a day, path a day, a pathanol, it would not work because, you know, that's, so they need a constant and pathanol using for law four times or five times doesn't work because it's got a very strong pH. If you use three or four times, it will rub your epithelium off. So along with an anti-allergic, it works wonderfully well because it adds value to, it, mm -hmm. it gives your support to that anti-allergic. So if you do a path a day or one of those, whatever you want to use, once a day, if you use this, it's like four times it works, but it works the same way as your path a day without actually compromising your epithelium. That's the second thing. And the third thing is uh, post-refractive surgery. Now everybody wear masks and everybody has, and you don't want to load all your patients with the cyclosporin for six months or whatever, because you see a lot of dryness then you don't want to use them. Then what you can do is you can always put, uh, this works very similar to uh, cyclosporin in a mild mild, uh, uh, mild uh, inflammation. So what uh, what, Shara, what uh, Natasha said is like it works in three ways, a mild inflammatory, mild anti-allergic and a lubricant. Mm -hmm. So if you look at that, wherever you need all the three together and wherever you're writing all the three together, you write one, it works very well. That is how I would uh, like to claim this. Thanks, Natasha. And any more questions on this? We will come back to you on this. Uh, Sharon, all yours. Dr. Sharon is a consultant, ocular surface, dry eye, and cornea specialist with us. And she's doing her PhD uh, now on uh, the, the whole immune pathways of uh, the dry eye and uh, all the related ocular surface uh, disorders. Uh, Sharon, uh, I'm, I see that uh, somebody is wearing multiple shoes. I think you can ex explain what it means and take it forward. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rohit. And it's, it's an honor to be here with all uh, the different panelists. Uh, so without further ado, after the brilliant talk by Natasha, um, this picture actually signifies how you know how we have to approach this problem because one shoe and one size really cannot fit all in this entire spectrum of what we call dry eye disease. So we know that the spectrum is very, very wide and ranges from no symptoms to multiple symptoms. There are patients who think they have dry eye, they've already been extensively examined. And definitely the same concept of just writing a lubricant drop and just sending them away is not going to work for everyone. So all of these are dry eye and we know clinically, we know that in our clinics, we see different, different spectra. Natasha has touched upon uh, the TFOS dues too. And I think the only important thing to highlight here in addition would be the concept of neuropathic pain, which is a totally new entity. And it, it does fit into a lot of patients who we cannot explain by other ways. A good idea is to approach these patients systematically. So you do still take the routine history, a very, very detailed history for these patients because they can have so many patient factors which impact their dry eye. Do the tests, including the slit lamp examination, lid evaluation, very detailed. So our basic diagnostics remain the same and uh, it's really not going to change. 
But we have a lot of advanced diagnostic tests and what becomes confusing is to try and figure out which of these tests we should do, which are required, when we should do. And that's what I want to uh, just try to demonstrate in these three very different cases that I saw in my OPD over the last few months. So this was a 35 year old lady with severe rheumatoid arthritis. She had chronic severe aqueous deficiency dry eye, came with worsening of the pricking sensation in the eyes and photophobia. So she was already on systemic therapy with oral methotrexate and HCQs as per the immunologist. So the first thought which comes if you have a patient of chronic dry eye aqueous deficient is whether their immunosuppression is adequate enough. And once you see the dosages or you see how their uh, previous reports are and uh, their RA factor, et cetera, you know whether they are on well-controlled uh, uh, systemic illness. So this patient, in addition, was already on a good lubricating drop. She was on a preservative-free cyclosporin and a gel at night and had been quite stable, but had worsened. So what then had happened in addition? So this is how her clinical picture looked. And if you see her cornea, you can see that there's a lot of staining, there's a lot of punctate erosions. And what is highlighted are the filaments that have now formed on her ocular surface. And filaments can cause a lot of irritation and photophobia sensation to these patients. And just a normal lubrication may not help them. So in addition, I added on a uh, mixture of acetylcysteine drops, which I prepared in the OPD. Uh, it's quite easy to do from uh, acetylcysteine solution, which is available for inhalation. Added on a steroid and removed the few filaments which were there. If she had not responded to this, I would have gone ahead and used a bandage contact lens, but thankfully she did respond to this treatment. So this is just to highlight how a small, you know, uh, another examination can uh, change our preconceived notions. This is the next uh, patient who's a 42 year old male coming with recurrent episodes of redness, irritation, and pain, extensively evaluated outside, diagnosed as dry eye. Shamas was showing a borderline aqueous deficiency dry eye, but also had a T-butt, a little bit of staining. But when we looked closer, we see that the lids, as Dr. Rohit was saying, it's very important to look at the lids, and it's not just to write a mild MGD, but if you look closely, you can see a lot of telangiectatic glands. You press on the lids, you see how the secretions are. They had a low MGS score, which is the meibomian gland scoring, did a mebography, he does show 25 to 30% dropout. And so this patient, in addition to having his aqueous deficiency dry eye, also had severe lid uh, related changes which were causing his symptoms. When we look at the mebography, it's quite useful to document how these patients are doing. It's good to explain to the patient and also gives an objective assessment. So for this patient, in addition to what he was already on, we added on the treatment for MGD and evaporated dry eye. Uh, we have found very good use with the eye masks, which are available. Uh, so you can explain that good lid hygiene. Oral doxycycline is very, very useful for these patients, depending on how severe you can give an OD or a BD dose and an antibiotic ointment at the lid margins. He still had a bit of symptoms, so we went ahead and did the intense pulse light therapy. And these are the conditions where you may find that these procedural therapies have a very good and fast effect when there are multiple different factors which are affecting these eyes. So he did... Uh, very well. Other procedural therapies, we know that there's the lipiflow, which is both the heat followed by mechanical therapy and the eye light, which has uh, polychromatic light and photobiomodulation. So uh, coming to our third case, which was again a patient who came with severe dry eyes, uh, supposed dry eyes, very severe eye pain, photophobia, not relieved by any medications, extensively evaluated outside, immune workup completely normal, uh, dry eye evaluation completely normal but very, very symptomatic. She had an OSDI score of above 50. So this had us really stumped and we went ahead and did the confocal microscopy because we were suspecting a neuropathic component to her dry eye. And sure enough, we did find that she had some microneuromas and other changes of uh, related to a neuropathic pain like uh, looping and beading of the nerves. So we diagnosed her as a neuropathic pain and she was referred to the neurologist for further pain management. Other changes which are also very classic to dry eye are the presence of the aberrant nerve loops. You can have interneural connections and the presence of a lot of dendritic cells uh, just push us towards uh, more of an inflammatory cause for the dry eye. And you do need to add on uh, a lot of anti-inflammatory to these patients. But if you don't have a confocal microscopy with you, an OSDI is an excellent tool to you know, uh, sort of predict which of these patients could be having a neuropathic component and we do use it regularly in our patients with dry eye. Other features that you could always look at at the slit lamp 
are for conjunctival chalases, which mimics a dry eye and lead to hypoepitheliopathy. So these are, you know, uh, oft missed signs that are very, very important. Also important to look for the nutritional status. Vitamin D is very, very common, the deficiency, and it's important to look for it. And we've proven it with our work and work around the world have shown that it has a very, very important role to play. We also know that dry eye is not just the presence or absence of a low tear film, but also it is the quality of tears which matter. And this would really be very important in patients who are planning surgery, either a cataract or a refractive surgery. So the future, of course, for these patients would be if, you know, we are talking about inflammatory markers, the future would be to try and pick out which markers are up or down and try to treat them. And that would be the true customization that we have in future. So just to highlight again the algorithmic approach to diagnostic tests, you start with the history, the questionnaire, do all your non-invasive tests first, then go into the staining pattern and T-BUT, then go for your Shermers. And this, of course, a lot of people do differently and look very classically for your lids. And if you have a group one, which is a mild aqueous deficiency, and this has been discussed, but if it's more frequent installation, please use a preservative-free medication um, check the vitamin D levels, more severe dry eye, you have to increase the frequency, add on the cyclosporin, preferably preservative free, consider adjuvants like the punctal plugs, and of course the blood investigations for more severe disease. If it's evaporative tripe, you start with the basic medication, and then we have a lot of procedural therapies to uh, use if they are not responding, and of course the neuropathic pain that we talked about. Not to underscore, you have to look for the demodex infestation in patients who have chronic blepharitis not responding to treatment. So with that, I come to the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much and thank you to DOS. It's been lovely. Thank you, Sharon. That was a brilliant presentation, as always. Um, I just have one question. You mentioned about the neuropathic pain earlier and uh, do you feel that the patients who have neuropathic pain or have neuromas, uh, do you think they are in general, they have a lower pain threshold? So that's a very good question, Natasha, because um, it could be, it's possible, um, but uh, there's no way to quantify a threshold of pain unless we look at a normal spectrum. And if we had these patients with even nothing, even on the confocal microscopy, then maybe you just say that it's a low pain threshold or they have something else which is like a stressor or a psychosomatic pain. But once we found something on uh, the confocal, probably uh, it's, there is something to it there and not just the pain threshold, but it's possible, it's possible. So. Also, um, would you want to do a PRK in this? Like if there is a neuroma, would you want to ablate that uh, neuroma altogether or do you feel that it was in such uh, situation? Correct. So again, a very good question because uh, we don't know what has caused the neuroma, nor we, do we know the direct effects or causative effects of it. So the nerves of the uh, cornea are known to produce certain neurotropic neuropeptides, and we don't know what a microneuroma or how it's different. So if you ablate it, uh, we may just worsen uh, something without knowing what it is. So not, not immediately. Do you feel causes more haze in, in patients who have microneuromas? Like you rightly said, there are a lot of neurotropins that are there on the surface. So I think the haze relation would be more to do with uh, if they had more of dendritic cells, uh, because that is a marker for inflammation on the cornea. Um, so that is quite a direct correlation, probably. The neuroma is not truly, but uh, we could have wound healing issues, uh, which, which may be there because of the nerve-related factors. Uh, I have a question, Sharon, uh, that uh, because the uh, confocal is available at your institute, I think it's easy to diagnose such cases. But what would, your, what would your uh, take home point or advice for people who do not have an access to confocal? How do we approach with such cases? Or how do we kind of, you know, come to this diagnosis that the patient could be? Uh... True. So uh, my... If, if so, confocal is just like a confirmation of what my mind has sort of slotted the patient into. Okay, sure. so uh, one test which is very useful is the paracain challenge test, uh, which is some where you put paracain into the eye. So there's this concept of pain in the eye where you have a peripheral sensitization and a central sensitization. So it's there for all kinds of pain, including spinal cord related pains. So Till it's in the peripheral zone, it can be controlled with uh, a topical medication. 
whereas even an ocular pain can become a central sensitization in that case then they will definitely need uh, something like a gaba related drug pregabalin or one of those medications to reduce the pain so one very useful thing is the paracaine challenge test where you just put paracaine in the eye and ask the person whether their pain reduces if the pain doesn't reduce even with the topical anesthetic then you're quite sure that it's gone into a central sensitization of course you could have a psychosomatic pain which doesn't reduce at all but that's that's a totally different matter but this is a very very useful test i do rely on the osdi as i said very highly and if there's a severe pain where and everything else seems normal i would again first think of a neuropathic pain and we have a very good relation with our neurologist so i do uh, call him up and tell him about these patients and tell him the background and once he assesses he decides whether to start the patient on one of these tca inhibitors or gaba related medications so i refer them anyway and only after everything is ruled out would i say psychosomatic so and so these uh, two things clinically you, would be helpful have you seen any association with these patients who have this uh, neuromas whether they do have any kind of vitamin b12 or d3 deficiency or there's no correlation now so not to the neuromas per se but the other uh, factors like the dendritic cells those those have we have found correlations to the uh, dcs yeah and the vitamin d thank you sharan excellent no case problem. uh shahid just one more question uh you uh, mentioned about the choice of uh, using ipl and thermal pulsation um is there an algorithm or uh, how do you decide the choice of treatment uh, for which kind of patients so if you could okay. do so, that so um very grossly if we look at the thermal pulsation it's heating and expressing okay so it's a mechanical pressure out of the glands um whereas the ipl works a lot on the uh, say the lid changes it till angiectasia and those kind of chronic changes so if if you see a lot of very chronic those kind of vessels vascularization and all the ipl could maybe work better but you'd still need to express the glands so you still have to tell the patient to go ahead and express whereas uh, the thermal lipid flow if i see very very badly blocked glands i probably choose the thermal pulsation you know which needs that expression otherwise it's not going to help so all right thank you okay. for that thank um, you again a brilliant presentation sharan as always uh, we will uh, move on to the next talk uh, which is by dr arvin morya is dr arvin here dr arvin i think he's not joined in natasha we can uh, go ahead with pooja's talk message saying he's joined i saw his message saying he's joined yeah i saw the message that he's joined there a similar oh yes there i think he's there i can see his name dr arvind yeah can you hear me yes now we can hear you yeah all right uh, so uh, it is an honor to in introduce dr arvind morya uh, dr arvind would be sharing his clinical experience in using trehalose eye drop uh, dr arvind over to you Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I will be speaking on our clinical experience of using this novel disaccharide trehalose in dry eye disease. So, as we all know, that the dry eye is a multifactorial disease of tears and ocular surface. It causes discomfort, visual disturbances, and tear film instability, and damaging the ocular surface. And the DED has a worldwide incidence of five percent to fifty percent. prevalence more in females and in age group of more than 45 years and because of the increased dependence on the digital devices during the covid time has further increased the prevalence because there is an inc incomplete blinking that leads to tear film instability and according to tofs uh, dw's second workshop they had really find dry eye as the multifactorial disease of ocular surface and tear film instability and hyperosmolarity that leads to ocular surface inflammation and along with the evaporative and aqueous deficiency dd so we require a multi pronged approach while treating the tear insufficiency lid abnormalities ocular inflammation along with the dietary changes and environmental modifications so there are various topical drugs are available like the cmc spmc spgor sodium malonate as well as the pva now trihalose in combination with the existing lubricant 
along with the sodium halonate. And so this trihalose is a naturally occurring disaccharide and is that's proven homeostasis and benefit patients of the DED. How it acts? It increases the autophagy. It protects the cultured human corneal epithelial cell membrane. It prevents cell death by desiccation and it preserves normal cellular morphology of cell membrane and also their proliferative activity. Also, these autophagic genes are activated like the FOXO1, LC3, BATLIN1, SQUESTEM1, and ATG5. So at molecular level, it works as a cryoprotective agent that prevents crystallization of protein hydration water. So what has been clinically done and what different we did? There are many randomized clinical trials, but most studies like the uh, adequate sample size or the patients were not followed for a longer period of time. Only Chiambaretta et al. evaluated more than 100 patients in an RCT between trihalose combination with sodium halonate and sodium halonate alone. So we did a randomized control trial along with the CTRI registration, and it has the highest sample size in all worldwide studies of 384. And the participants were 15 to 74 year age group OPD patient complaining of dryness, watering, etc. And the OSDI shimmers, t but were done. And the patients with chronic drug intake, like the antidepressants and the antihistaminics, that leads to DED were also included. And the patient with prior ocular surgery or any previous ocular lubricant use, and those who failed to give consent were excluded. Then the randomization and masking was done. And the patients were clinically assessed by the OSDI questionnaire. Must test t but with fluorescent strip and TFH measurement over the select lamp and the VB conjectural staining score with rose bengal staining was done and the patients were followed on the fourth as well as the eighth week. So results, females were 59% and the males were 41%. So while comparing the humor test, the tree hellos, it shows a significant p-value because, but it was not showing at four week time. So this is the importance of increasing the follow-up time. So there was a significant p-value difference between the two groups. It was better in Trihalose group. Regarding the T-PUT, baseline was 6.07 and 5.46 in the SH. So at eight, eight, eight weeks, it increased to 9.50 and 7.76, but there was no significant p-value in both the groups. While comparing the TFL might, it also increased in both the groups and there was no significant p-value difference at eight week time period. Now, while comparing the uh, van bristol scoring, it also shows improvement. Almost 88% they show no staining or mild staining in the group A and almost the same number the 66% and the 29%, they show uh, no stain to mild stain. Now on comparing the OSDI, it also improves significantly and it becomes quite normal or mild DED in more than 89% of the cases in the tree halos group and 96% in the sodium halonate group. So in the discussion, there are many randomized controlled trial like the Chiambaretta et al, Matsu et al, but the sample size was 105 in the Chiambaretta et al. In Matsu et al study, it was 34 patient only. and the Doran et al, it was 52. In our study, it was 192 in each arm. And all these studies have shown that this tree halos along with the adjunct of sodium alloyd had shown uh, improvement in the OSDI scoring, as well as it proves very uh, beneficial role in treatment of the DED. So merits of our clinical study, it has a large sample size and we, we followed the strict adherence to the randomization and masking protocols and we had a relatively long follow-up. Demerits, lack of use of more sophisticated tools for TF film assessment. So this might influence the subjective OSDI scoring system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arvind.
Uh, that was a wonderful presentation, a very nice summary and a wonderful study that you have done. Um, so do you have a particular uh, protocol in which do you prescribe Trello's or is it uh, uh, in most of your patients or and, and do you start it pre-operatively and post-operatively? What is your choice of uh, treatment in, in terms of choosing the lubricant? Uh, in uh, the post-operative patient, we prefer carboxymethyl cellulose only. Until unless the dry is quite serious from moderate to severe category, then only we go for trihalu. Do you also prescribe it preoperatively in certain patients? Maybe for yeah, the if, cataract? If there is, the yeah, if there is proven dry, and while doing the biometry, we are facing problem. So we start with the uh, these uh, CMC or and the sodium alumnate also. That depends on the grading of the dryness. Perfect. Um, are there any more questions? Like we haven't had any questions from the audience. Um, so I think uh, we will move on to the next talk. And in the meantime, if we have any more questions, people can just uh, put it in the chat box and we'll be more than happy to take them. Uh, our next speaker um, is uh, Dr. Pooja Kamar. She's a consultant at uh, um, Nara Netrale. And she is um, a brilliant surgeon and a brilliant clinician and a scientist. Um, I've had the fortune of working with her for some time. And um, uh, I would, uh, she's going to address a wonderful and a most relevant topic right now uh, in our new normal, uh, that is uh, using trehlos in, in the COVID-19 times. Uh, Dr. Pooja, all over to you. Thank you, Dr. Natasha, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, you've already, all of you, you, Dr. Arvind, have already spoken about role of tree hellos uh, in dry diseases and other conditions. So you've made my job very simple. So we all know we are facing this uh, unusual, like scary pandemic, uh, which none of us want, but however, we have to. So I'm just going to be talking about how the role of uh, tree hellos uh, can, like how tree hellos can help us clinicians and our patients in this COVID-19 times. Uh, and I have no financial interests here. Whatever I'm going to speak is just based on our experience and the studies which we have done at our institute and grow lab. Um, so uh, I'll be dividing my talk into four parts. Well, first of all, it would be the profile access for healthcare workers. Uh, I'm, just, I'm not going to go into base of what tree hellos is and how it helps because you all have covered it. I'm going to go straight into the topic. So recently, a uh, few months back when we were in like the peak of uh, coronavirus and the COVID cases all over India, a group like uh, we healthcare professionals are at the highest risk. And because we come across patients uh, who um, might be COVID positive, who are probably asymptomatic carriers, which we don't know of. And a lot of them are treating actually the COVID-19 patients. So we, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rohit Shetty led this group and we formulated these guidelines on how, uh, or an algorithmic approach on how various drugs or which drugs or what do you do uh, so that you can, uh, you can prevent yourself uh, from the risk of COVID-19 and probably try uh, not, like, you know, probably not have it. So this was published in IJO and it is, uh, Delight to say that it's one of the trending articles. Uh, what we did was we saw the drugs which were already available in market. Uh, this is for ocular surface. And we, uh, along with my colleague, Dr. Archana, uh, we framed this guideline on how tree hellos and other drugs can prevent uh, the uh, COVID recept, like the COVID virus from going inside the eye. Now, interestingly, what we had found in our studies, which is still under uh, like uh, various uh, phases of uh, study uh, that the eye, the cornea, your epithelium has a lot of ACE2 uh, receptors like the COVID-19 receptors, which are very much susceptible that they can catch this virus and it can affect your eyes as well. Luckily, a lot of us have not seen a lot of COVID-19 cases related to eye, but our cornea and our epithelium has a lot of this ACE2 receptors, which can bind uh, this uh, COVID-19 and it can affect your lid. So trehalose was one of the drops uh, which can... Um, uh, can uh, prevent the COVID-19 receptors from affecting your eye. A uh, lot of work has been done on other uh, like organs as well about how uh, trehalose can 
bind or how trihalose can prevent the binding of this receptors and it can uh, prevent from going inside and also it helps us in mitigating the stress so what pre uh, trihalose is done does is it just not modulate the autophagy but it induces autophagy and it also prevents this uh, receptors from entering your eye so this was a normal uh, scoring system which we devised a low moderate and high risk and based on that we devised whether uh, Uh, what all you can do, and you, a lot of healthcare professionals can use three halos eye drops, including all of us uh, who are seeing the patients who fall under the high risk categories for more than four hours. Uh, you can use it three to four times in a day, along with the ICM. This is an older chart, but according to the ICM guidelines, you can have oral uh, ivermectin or HCQs as well, and this will actually prevent your eyes from catching any conjunctivitis or other diseases related to three halos. uh now uh, the most prevent like one of the things which can prevent us from get catching this virus is wearing a mask so what does this mask do this mask is it like in a, like okay we are wearing this mask to prevent the covid-19 virus but is that it does this mask affect your eyes in any ways the answer is yes this is how your normal ocular surface looks like these are the images from the holotomography high resolution camera if you can this you guys might be very much familiar with how this organelles look like these are the golgi bodies and everything uh, how your normal cells in the eye looks like and this is how your cells are when they are without any stress in the normal condition but however when your uh, these are your golgi bodies however uh, and this is your healthy eyes the nerves are healthy the epithelium is good your molecular markers are well within normal limits the patients don't have any uh, discomfort like when you ask them about any complaints they don't have any discomfort so this is how your healthy eye looks like but like you know we all of us are wearing mask especially our healthcare professional and our patients as well uh, whenever you wear a mask uh, all your breath like this is one of our theories all your uh breath have enhanced they go up to your eye and that's why there is enhanced evaporation of tear film and there is a hypercapnia all your exhaled air has a lot more carbon dioxide at this level than the atmospheric carbon dioxide so this leads to a lot of dryness or inflammation and it increases the oxidative stress on your eye and it can lead to discomfort pain if you have any disease like keratoconus it can lead to progression or if you are doing any uh surgery like a refractive or cataract surgery your patients might be unhappy after surgery because the surface is highly unhealthy there is a lot of inflammation present and you have operated on this eye and uh, that's why they are going to have lot more symptoms after surgery and also natasha very nicely mentioned that you know even the kids nowadays are using a lot of digital divide, devices for the school so all this is going to affect their ocular surface health and this is how like you saw how the healthy cells look like and whenever your ocular surface is under tremendous stress this is how it is going to look like you can hardly make out any cells uh, the cell bodies the cells have started shrinking and the filaments which are responsible to for your nutrition the traveling of the nutrition from one cell to another they are also shrink so they cannot transport the cells very effectively and this is how your cells are under a stressed condition and your epithelium is going to be bad your nerves are going to be unhealthy dr sharan nicely mentioned about the unhealthy nerves and the dendritic cells the microneuromas they are going to be much higher in this patients than the normals uh, which are going to have them give them a lot of discomfort which you can know from the osdi one of the questionnaires is the osdi scoring which is going to be highly abnormal so now what do we do okay uh, we we tried doing some treatment on the cell lines by using various drugs for example three halos and when we treated this patients uh, with three halos you can see the cell bodies have started the cell proliferation has started the cargo transport of the nutrition has started through this filaments and even the junctions have started forming again so and the nuclear division has been better than what you saw in the oxidative stress this is just the um, okay i'm sorry this i had a comparative slide which i'm not able to play so whenever you uh use a drug like three halos uh, just after 2 hours of treatment just see how effective the cells become in the oxidative stress has become much 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 lower so what you all said you can actually see at the cell line how it is happening now how like you know now, now we know that it acts now how does it help us help us in our cataract and refractive surgery mask wearing is going as i said it's going to affect your uh ocular surface and whenever you uh, do a surgery there is a surgical insert that itself is going to lead to some kind of dryness and wound healing is going to happen 
Now at this point of time, your ocular surface is unhealthy or you're wearing masks. There is a lot of hypercapnia and a lot of these things present. So your wound healing is going to be altered. And there is a lot of uh, uh, alteration in your collagen matrix degeneration going to happen, which can lead to probably pain, fibrosis, uh, or ectasia, and it will alter your surgical outcome. So this is how your uh, epithelium is. And if you do a surgery on this kind of epithelium or an unhealthy ocular surface, there is going to be poor nerve regeneration, poor wound healing, which you can see with the irregular epithelium, which is going to impact your optics. Your optics is going to be highly uh, altered, which can lead to glare or halos complaint. Your cataract and both refractive surgery patients are going to come back with your glare and halos complaint. Now, if you feel the ocular surface is healthy and you've put a premium eye well, like a multifocal eye well or a toric eye well, uh, post-operatively, they are going to be unhappy. You will feel everything is within normal limits, your angle carpas and everything. Then why are still patients ha having glare and halos? Because the ocular surface was unhealthy. You did a surgery on them and that's why this happened. And they are going to have be having a poor quality of life and not just their quality of life is going to be messed up, but it is going to haunt us as well as surgeons. And how is it going to affect the refractive surgeries? Like there are different signatures for each of the surgery. But our group uh, has done a lot of extensive work that your ocular surface is unhealthy before surgery. Then post-operatively in PRK, you can have haze, uh, ectasia, which this work was published by Dr. Natasha uh, for her PhD. If you have a lot of inflammation present before LASIK and you do a LASIK surgery, you can land up into ectasia. And the same thing which can happen to smile because the inflammation is going to alter your LOX levels, which can also lead to ectasia. Now, what can we do is, uh, yes, we can give all our treatments, but along with all our other treatments, uh, tree halos containing lubricating drops are highly effective in this kind of patients before surgery. Uh, you give, uh, you treat them for vitamin D supplementation and micronutrients. If there are any severe cases, you can give cyclosporin as well. Once the inflammation has come under control, once it has reduced, you go ahead and do your refractive or a cataract surgery. Now, how is it going to help in keratoconus? Yes, it has a helping uh, role in keratoconus as well. Uh, this was uh, Dr. Rohit Chetty's uh, Rangachari paper where they have seen differences between the uh, progressing and the stable group. And they, they saw that patients with a uh, high amount of inflammation like MMP9, they had higher chances of progression than staying stable. So now what do we do? We, uh, we've done this uh, work on the cell lines uh, where we have seen that effect of tree halos on CMC on uh, MMP9 marker, which is responsible for your progression. MMP9 is one of the inflammatory markers. If it's higher, it can lead to progression. So we compared it with two groups, one with normal CMC and one with the tree halos uh, containing drops. So we see that here there is high, like significant reduction when they use tree halos compared to that of CMC on MMP9, which is the inflammatory markers. And actually our patients stayed stable. These are the patients who have not undergone surgery and they stay, stay stable at six months visit as well. And there was there is a reduction in MMP9 levels as well. And this was very nicely discussed by Rohit sir, Sharon ma'am and Natasha and Sheetal. So this is a simple algorithm uh, in COVID times if you cannot do a surgery or if there is a challenge or even if you're doing a surgery uh, if there's a lot of ocular surface inflammation present we treat them before the allergies their serum ig levels the vitamin d levels and along with that for medical management if there is a low risk of progression we give them tree halos containing artificial tear eye drops uh, or we add, if it's a medium grade of progression, like if it's a medium this thing risk, we add top it up with cyclosporin A. And if it's a higher thing, you can do one of your uh, newer generation dry eye therapies. So pre-op COVID eras, yes, it was very easy to do a corneal cross-linking. But now as there is a lot of uh, ocular inflammation, while you're waiting for cross-linking, you can uh, do one of these therapies, uh, reduce the inflammation and then go ahead with the surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pooja. Brilliant presentation as always. Uh, congratulations on the extensive work. Um, I just have one question. Uh, you said for the medium uh, grade of uh, keratoconus, you could you could use combination of trehalose and cyclosporin. Uh, now both of them have got very different pathways of action. Do you do you think it's uh, it's okay? I mean, they have an additive effect, um, or they have an adjuvant adjuvant effect, or um, uh, would you recommend just using them in isolation, which is more effective in terms of efficacy? Um, as I said, if it's a low grade, uh, only tree halos would work because it works excellently well in mild grade uh, grades. But if it's a moderate grade, you can always top it up with cyclosporin because adding, topping it up is going to have an additive effect and not just a 
uh, giving a single drop so if it's a moderate grade you can you i would suggest to add both the drugs and do it because it's going to help like uh, as trialos is as you mentioned uh, you discussed uh, amongst yourselves that only trialos is going to control your low, low grades of inflammation but topping it up is going to have an extra additive effect and also if your patients have uh, chronic allergies or they are chronic eye rubbers uh, which are not controllable like which are moderate grade you would give both the drops then uh i want to congratulate pooja for this excellent thing because uh, as we all know that uh, this particular hypercapnia because of the mask uses can uh, are in fact causing this neurological complications in people who are continuously wearing mask uh, it was really nice for me to know that okay this is affecting our surface also and it makes sense that why is it affecting because none of these masks are snugly fit and uh, you know that can cause the other thing what i wanted to ask is now because of this hypercapnia obviously the corneal epithelium is having maybe less oxygen and more of co2 is it having any effect on the endothelial cells or is there any evidence of mild corneal edema you are noticing i think that dr sharan would my uh, be able to comment on it further but i don't think it is having effect on the endothelium that's of an effect yeah but epithelium definitely it affects the epithelium uh, we have worked on some tear biomarkers before covid and after covid where pa patients or uh, our staff has started wearing masks and over there also we are seeing uh, quite variation our epithelium maps before and after covid also have changed uh, luckily we had few patients who had uh, in normal patients not keratoconus who had an epithelium map before covid and now we are redoing it and there is an extent like a lot of patients we are seeing change uh, either they are getting hypertrophied either they are getting uh, thinning there is a different combination but yes because of the stress that is of being affected so that is, that means your ocular surface is on there's a lot of inflammation on your ocular surface and that's why you need to treat uh, this things and the best part about trihalose is it's a sodium hyaluronate kind based uh, uh, drop so it actually helps uh, much more than others Oh, one more question dr pooja so you mentioned uh, the the image was a very good justification and validation of the cell proliferation and the nuclear uh, uh, fragmentation that was happened that started as early as 2 hours after the installation of trellos um, but how long does this just this effect last like what should be the ideal dosage of of using trellos in this case so i actually because of time i didn't put a publication which was done by another group but they have done a similar study on how frequently your drop should be instilled how frequent how long it stays on your ocular surface and they said the ideal time for it would be to repeat it after every 4 hours so we give it four times in a day whenever the patients are awake so at every 4 hours it would be an ideal time Or maybe just to add pooja it's a very good idea i i don't know whether it has been already done but if it has not done to start doing it is uh, to document the specular microscopy in in staff who is wearing a long hours of mask you know that would give us some idea whether it is causing any change on the endothelium Ex excellent uh, observation and excellent yeah. study yeah like it's like um, uh, we are ourselves the desiccation models for dry eye disease the things that they try on rats uh, just because of wearing masks we become the desiccation models uh taran ma'am might be able to comment on this for the row itself we had a uh, very i mean i don't know pooja must have discussed with this uh, that we had a tear sample of lot of our pay, lot of our healthy volunteers year back i mean before covid and we took the tear samples now and we analyzed them in this one year uh, they were all hospital based so we had a clear idea about how many hours they were wearing masks and all just lot of changes i mean uh, in the ocular surface including one of our new fellow had taken up the epithelial mapping because we had the basement epithelial mapping done before covid for different work and uh, you see how the epithelium has changed i mean how they would change how the epithelium would become more uh, inferiorly steepened so there is a lot of stuff happening uh, because of mask which no yeah this is amazing because they are noticing lot of neurological symptoms in pe uh, in people who wear mask continuously so this is something which is i think uh, not studied very well and i in fact when puja started her talk i was just wondering that why would it cause uh, effect on eye you know till she showed that uh, particular slide where the air can actually uh, 
you know, it's it's carbon dioxide. No, I mean, yeah, I think yeah. The I carbon think dioxide creates change in your pH, and pH would change change in your cells. Yes, yes. yes. And it is more in all of us. All the people sitting in this group and watching are the ones who would have the maximum because uh, we use it more than uh, somebody who is uh, not in the hospital. So I think. Uh, uh, I mean, this model is really uh, useful because it is a real, like Natasha said, is a pure desiccation model. You don't need the same model was used by. You Steve don't need Lupelder. that. Lupelder. And in uh, when he designed the first uh, cyclosporin, he took those rats, put it into a chamber, and put a lot of air, air on blowing them. on them. Yeah. And that was a real desiccation model which was done, and now we are doing it on ourselves. We don't need rats anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I said. Uh, so I just uh, uh, had one question. In uh, If there is um, a certain amount of swelling in the inferior epithelium, and then, uh, um, like we had discussed this earlier also, if we put a disaccharide um, on the ocular surface, would it cause more swelling of the epithelium? Uh, today, morning I got a, today morning, I got a scan uh, sent by somebody. The person said the uh, PRK was done, but the patient ended up after one month with the one diopter cylinder. Should I recorrect? I said, can you have the epithelial map? Yeah. The epithelial map, she said, sent. the epithelial map shows, looks like a nice bow tie uh, cylindrical pattern. This, for some reason, is following a bow tie of cylinder on the epithelium, which is causing that diopter. So I told her to use the uh, trehello specifically because it evens out the uh, stress. Okay. What happens is the one, why do you epithelium gets hyperplasia? Because there is a lot of stress in the uh, basement uh, basal cells and that is creating tremendous amount of stress and making them uh, you know, m mature faster or they replicate faster. Right. So when you put this, it reduces the stress and takes the inflammation out. So that is what I do. When I see a very irregular epithelium, I use this so that after two, three months, you'll see a very nice uniform epithelium there. So uh, can we can we take this as a take-home point, Dr. Rohit, that in this COVID and mask era, when we are planning a refractive surgery or a cataract surgery, do we need to start them on trehalose because of pre -op. this particular thing? Yeah, pre-op as well as post-op. I used to do it during the peak times. Now, you know, now like everybody else, we think that COVID has disappeared. It has not. The mask is still on. <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely. That is one of my drug of choice. Sodium yeah. hyaluronate, yes. but uh, So, would you like to move to Dr. Arvind, who is the next speaker? So, he, he finished, sir. He finished, okay. okay. So, um, who's next? Sheetal? Uh, yeah, Sheetal. So, um, it would be an honor Dr. to... Arvind, call... a great paper in uh, Taiwan Ophthalmic. So I, I, it, was, it was something which was very necessary and... Uh, it was wonderfully written. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Very beautifully written paper. Thank you, sir. So, uh, so we are the last uh, speaker and probably that will be followed by uh, a group discussion and probably questions from the audience. Uh, it, I, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sheetal. Uh, she's a brilliant ocular surface and cornea surgeon uh, based in Gujarat. <clears throat> and uh, a wonderful surgeon and a very, uh, how do you say, flamboyantly thinking, um, uh, clinically applying uh, uh, clinician uh, who is using her clinical knowledge in all the clinical research um, and getting the best outcomes for her patients. So um, uh, over to you, Dr. Sheetal. Thank you, Natasha, for amazingly kind words. Uh, anyway, so after these uh, stellar talks by all of, uh, by all the uh, speakers, I'm going to share a few of my cases, which I see it in my OPD about the dry eye. So as our opening batsman said, Natasha, uh, that dry eye is much beyond lubricating drops. And I'm sure that whatever we have and uh, whatever with this new research, we are going to have much more than what it is there today also. So I'll be sharing my, uh, I'll be taking you all through a few of my cases. So my first case is about a 60 year old female. Uh, she came to our OPD with foreign body sensation, pain, burning. She was on lubricating drops since a year or so and her symptoms worse than post cataract surgery. So these are her slit lamp pictures. So when you see her uh, unstained picture, the uh, her uh, furnaces are pretty deep, although her surface looks pretty lusterless. 
when we stained her, there were lots of fine small epithelial erosions. The left eye was more or less the same, like right eye, like rather a little more severe. So at this point in time, uh, when we think about such a patient, uh, what questions do we want to ask? We consider the age, gender and symptoms, 60-year-old female patients and symptoms of dry eye, which worsened after her cataract surgery. So at this point, we definitely want to ask something about joint pain because a 60-year-old female has a more chances of having rheumatoid arthritis or some kind of autoimmune disorder which can contribute to her dry eye. Of course, you have to examine the lids and uh, rule out the MGD component also because along with a uh, lot of other dry eyes, you will also have uh, MGD component. So the basic uh, questions what we need to ask is history of joint pains, dry mouth to uh, rule out primary Sjogren's. And what if this patient was younger is something which you need to ask in rashes to rule out the SLE or ATOP. Uh, ATOP. Uh, generally, uh, what I like to do is ask all the history because there is no set rule that this particular uh, disease will occur at this age only. There are always some outliers in our medical field. So what other diagnosis you should think of a patient who is old aged and dry eye is something uh, something known as ocular secretion pemphigoid. Although this does not fit, this particular case does not fit into this, but you should always have that particular diagnosis also at the back of your mind where your phonysis will be shallower rather than deep like in this lady. So the investigations I asked for uh, this patient was CBC with ESR, RA factor and ANA factor by indirect immunofluorescence. So all the factors were like uh, highly positive. So this was a clear cut case of rheumatoid arthritis. That is your secondary uh, Sjogren syndrome. So how do we manage such cases? Definitely your lubricating drops. Again, I prefer uh, sodium hyaluronate over CMC drops in such dry eye, gel at bedtime. Surface steroid, because all of us know that the chronic dry eye cause uh, uh, ocular surface inflammation and you need to control that because the inflammation, it's kind of a vicious cycle. The dry eye causes inflammation, inflammation increases your dry eye and it continues. So you need to control your surface inflammation and just for the systemic condition, yes, you need to give systemic steroids in the beginning period and then later on on the immunosuppressants that I generally treat along with my, immuno, uh, along with my rheumatologist. So what else can we do? These are the things which we need to do when we see a case of dry eye with rheumatoid arthritis or any other collagen vascular disease. Uh, what other things which we need to do if the patient is not still uh, asymptomatic or symptom free is punctal plug because we all know that these are the cases, the autoimmune disorder, they affect our lacrimal glands and there is less of a tear secretion. Now, when there is less of tear secretion, whatever secretion is there, we need to preserve it. So for that, we can put punctal plugs if the patient is still uh, symptomatic after your normal treatment on the left-hand side. The other thing, which is again, one of my favorite is giving scleral lenses because scleral lenses come with the fluid reservoir. So it gives a lot of comfort to the patient as well as it, in, it uh, improves the vision because your refractive medium, the interface changes from uh, your ocular surface air to the scleral lens to air. So that again helps a lot symptomatically as well as visually. And as I said earlier, that this is a case or these are the cases which you need to have a combined approach with your rheumatologist. So here, come, uh, here we come with the case number two, which was a 20 year old male who complained of decreased vision foreign body sensation of few years duration. I asked him all the questions, what I, what I generally ask in all the eye patients, like your joint pains, your uh, back aches, uh, your other symptoms like any kind of nose bleeding, any kind of cough, uh, your rashes and everything. And overall, this patient did not have any systemic complaints. This is a slit lamp picture, which you can see on the right hand side. In the diffuse elimination, there's a lustreless ocular surface with little corneal hair. On the left hand side, uh, on the right hand side, you see the stained picture with the coarse punctate epithelial erosions. You see the averted lids and we can very nicely see the keratinization of the lid margins. Now, this is a very uh, prominent lid margin keratinization, but it's a good idea to always stain your patients and see the stained lids also because it will give you much more information about your mucocutaneous junction than your diffusion, diffuse elimination. This is his left eye where you can see the thin panis on the cornea. And again, the stained picture shows a lot of staining of the ocular surface. Again, uh, the lead margins were totally keratinized. So what was this patient about? What specific history I would like to ask when I see a 20-year-old patient with dry eye, 
with lead margin keratinization the things which were and there was no systemic history so the thing which i which comes to my mind first is something like a steven johnson syndrome and the things which you need to ask is any kind of a drug reaction any kind of a drug intake any kind of fever because sometimes even post fever patient may not remember the uh, treatment but they will have the sjs episode and uh, sometimes you do see uh, skin patches again for atopy the chronic atopic patients can have this kind of picture and even the chronic chemical injuries will have the keratinization of the lids so these are the questions specifically you ask when you see the lid margin keratinization or any kind of cicatrization i asked all these things it was negative so the investigations done were again the routine uh, which i want to because if i don't get anything i still want to rule out some kind of hidden autoimmune disorder so we ordered for cbc asr ra factor i'm sure i must have done ana also and along with this i just thought of doing actually b51 because he was a young patient to my surprise not that i was expecting but he was actually b51 and 52 positive now when this when this uh, result came i went back and asked this patient specifically with whether he had any kind of oral or genital ulcers and he came up with this thing, with the history of genital ulcers few years back so this was a case of bechets now this is not a very common present presentation of bechets but bechets is again a mucus mucus membrane disorder so any mucus membrane disorder can have this kind of picture where your mucocutaneous junction can get affected where your keratinization the non keratinized uh, epithelium can get keratinized because your mucus membrane is getting affected and once your mucus membrane gets affected the whole cycle of dry eye starts and the cicatrization starts so this patient obviously required much more than your lubricating drops so we started along with a rheumatologist on him they initially we inducted him with the steroids and then he was put on mycophenolate uh, mofetil so the plan for this patient was obviously lead mucus membrane graft because his lids were very bad and if we keep those lids just like that he will have lead viper keratopathy because the keratinized rough surface will keep on hitting his cornea and the cornea will worsen uh, along with the time the other most important uh, and the most uh, favored uh, treatment of mine is giving the scleral lenses to such patients for the symptomatic relief as well as for the uh, for the vision purpose so we did give him uh, scleral lenses so this is the picture post scleral lenses and patient was symptomatically much better patient was much better even uh, visually so basically in this patient we started treated him for his bechets we gave him scleral lenses and the next plan was to do the lid mmg So now we come with our third case, where again a twenty-year-old male uh, came with decreased vision, foreign body sensation, and dry feeling. This was his vision in right and left eye. He did not have any systemic complaints. He did not have any history of conjunctivitis. I will come to that why I asked this particular history, uh, and uh, his knee bit was definitely low. His again the autoimmune workup was normal because we were not getting anywhere and. if you see his pictures he was already on the lubricating drops so most of the patients who come to us are generally on some kind of lubricating drops or cyclosporin because they've been treated most of the times before uh, they come to our reference center so these were his pictures of ocular surface so when i saw it there was no history all the investigations was normal the only thing which i had in mind was whether he had any kind of a previous insult to his eye because sometimes rarely post conjunctivitis you can get such kind of a picture so uh, we uh, started additionally along with his lubricating drops we made it into the preservative free so, uh, sodium hyaluronate drops and we gave him surface steroids also he did not feel better although this patient was slightly impatient also he wanted everything little faster so after a few days of uh, surface steroids and uh, uh, sodium hyaluronate we were still not really uh, having any great benefit so we decided to do the irpl that is your intense regulated pulse light treatment this is an ei so i'll show a short video uh, we'll, i'll just fast for fast forward it this is uh, it's like any you have to set the energy according to the skin tone and uh, this is what i think sharon has already explained uh, you give the intense pulse light and we all know that this how this has come into the ophthalmology the skin people used to give this treatment on cheeks for the acne treatment and what they noticed was people started having the excess curing or excess tear secretion post the acne treatment with these ipls so this is how it came into our ophthalmology practice 
so we gave this and uh, she felt so much better now we do not know exactly how irpl or ipl work but what nn team has again worked on this is it probably has some kind of a parasympathetic nerve supply role and it uh, through that it i think increases the lacrimal gland secretion i'm not very sure about it but this is what the assumption is right now about this particular treatment if we see before ei treatment and after the first sitting all the parameters were also greatly changed in fact we did not give him any second or third sitting for this particular patient and after the first sitting we continued him on drops and he is doing pretty well so this brings us to our last case that is case 4 is of a 14 year old male with dry eye and pain in the eye so when you see this patient again a lustreless ocular surface if you notice you can see some kind of mucocutaneous disturbance over here there is no normal mucocutaneous junction there is a speckled keratinization which has already started and if you can see there is a dystrichiatic row of lashes if you see at the medial canthus there is a semblephron which is already formed so this is again a cicatrization of the surface which is already started when we inverted the lid you can see that uh, calcification and uh, uh, keratinization of the lid margin this was his stained eye where there is absolutely no tear film so it is a very severe dry eye so what history again we would ask is the sjs is our first diagnosis so we need to ask about drug intake drug reaction any kind of skin lesions mouth ulcers because the mouth ulcers and skin lesions are so severe that patient generally never ever forgets this kind of an episode so they will definitely give you this history whether when they had this acute attack of sjs so you need to ask these histories when you see young patients with cicatrization uh, cicatrization and dry eyes so this was a clear cut case of steven johnson syndrome and what treatment is available for sjs now is again there are two three things besides your lubricating drops is lid margin mucous membrane graft to make that rough surface into a soft surface so that your lid wiper keratopathy is prevented many a times even the vascularization and thin pannis regresses after your lid mmd what other things we have in our uh, kitty nowadays for sjs is your scleral lenses and minor salivary gland transplant along with this i uh, i am uh, kind of uh, presented these four cases which had some kind of little thinking uh, than our normal dry eye cases so i hope uh, i hope we get some whole take home points that how do we evaluate our dry eye and how do we treat them besides our lubricating drops and are normal surface steroids or surface uh, anti inflammatory drops thank you so much thank you dr sheetal that was a wonderful presentation as expected uh, i just had one uh, comment uh, on your case number 3 on which you did the ei um i had a similar case well the patient uh, came uh, had uh, severe epithelial uh, erosions very rough lustreless cornea and uh, little later on uh, his his wife mentioned that he had some sort of paralysis of the face um and uh, uh, before that i the patient was already using lubricants for such a long time i decided to just uh, try uh, doing ei and uh, surprisingly he said that his he felt that the tone of his face muscles on the side that he had the bell's palsy he was feeling that it's better i i don't have any justification for it just one patient experience also his ocular surface became much better like the image that you showed um it just validated of what i had seen in the clinic and just yeah, uh, yeah i guess even sharon has some uh, cases where we do not have those typical cases where we use ipl treatment or irpl treatment but we do try it because we do not have any other thing for us to offer them and then we do see these wonderful results which do not explain properly but i guess uh, compared to lipid flow we have something some more mechanism which is going on over here which is through some kind of nervous system which nn has already explained uh, and uh, like you know what they see it in the skin uh, thing also that it definitely does uh, stimulate some nerves some glands so i guess uh, yes it has much more uh, kind of indications than what we were thinking of just mgd just one more thing what what did you eventually do for your case number 1 how did you treat oh that case uh, generally all these rheumatoid arthritis cases do pretty well once you start them on uh, she was not diagnosed rheumatoid arthritis so once you start the systemic treatment the symptoms improve a lot 
and it prevents lot of other things like sterile melts and all which could happen if you do not start the treatment second if they do not improve on my normal surface steroids and uh, sodium hyaluronate uh, lubricating drops i generally go step wise give initially the punctal plugs but they do not improve after that i do give them scleral lenses more or less most of them do pretty well on all these treatment in fact very few times i need to give scleral lenses in the uh, second issue group thank you dr shridhar are there any more questions any uh, any comment sharon do you want to share any of your uh, experience <laughs> i think uh, shital and i uh, we discuss so many different cases so yes it's it's always a joy to see the cases and there were some very very key points which you brought up in your presentation and uh, i'll take 10 seconds literally to highlight the first case i think so so important that before a cataract surgery which is one of the most common surgeries that we do we take that little time extra on the slit lamp we may not be able to do a shermers and everyone but look at the tear meniscus height and i think it's really very very useful to look at the tear meniscus and often you can pick up uh if a patient is likely to have some amount of dry and when in doubt do that shermers because it's always better to tell them before surgery than when they come back with some issue and then have to say that there is a dry eye which now needs treatment yes. because like, no matter how much we try to explain to them that it's not because of the surgery they still attribute it to the surgery yes. and as shital yes. rightly showed once you start them on the treatment if it's picked up early they do very very well so i think that is very very crucial very very important point the second being that in a patient who has lid margin keratinization of course the images she showed are quite distinct and stark but as you mentioned in subtle cases the staining the fluorescent staining is invaluable if no matter how subtle it is you will see that little change in the contour of the mucocutaneous junction and it really is important then to take a step back and look at what we are dealing with and in this case it was bechet which is so far from our routine run of the mill so, you know cicatrizing conditions but uh, for that patient it is probably sight saving because the management is so different from what we look at in sjs and in sjs of course you see a bad keratinization lid margin uh, mucous membrane graft and scleral lenses do wonder so so many take home points just based on a lot of clinical judgment and uh, adding on keep an open mind as to what uh you know what we can do for them so i think that way thank you sharon any concluding comments from the other speakers i think it's amazing for me the take home point is now before i do any kind of a surgery to look for the epithelium of a patient because of this mass thing it was really a uh, an eye opening for me because we all have heard only about the neurological complication nobody bothered about the hypercapnia causing anything on the surface uh, so that was really nice and a big take home point for me i guess yeah for, for me personally it was uh, using trellos uh, for i mean as just as a profile access because it's if it's blocking off the ace inhibitors uh, on the ocular surface and we all of us are working Uh, the mask is already causing a lot of desiccation and if you are already using lubricants which we are uh, it would be wise to use um, uh, a trellos which will probably block off the uh, ace inhibitor uh, ace uh, receptor sorry great uh, dr arvind any concluding comments yeah excellent talk by all the speakers and very good use of this uh, scleral lenses Uh, in the management of different type of dry and we can also do i would like to add one thing that we can do the swap source oct to measure the posterior scleral lens tear film uh, this losses so we can titrate our doses of our drugs so that is also a good thing that we can do in our practice wonderful dr pooja any concluding comments no i think for me like uh, obviously we have been working on trios and trying since a long time 
So Dr. Sheetan and Dr. Sharon Ma'am's cases would be different because there's a lot to learn for us from them. But uh, yes, I would just like to say that we being as healthcare professionals also can use trehalos because it gives, like we are under tremendous stress, like ocular discomfort. So it helps a lot because we have been using it since quite some time. And for a lot of our patients, as we discussed during our entire session, it be useful, especially those under or cataract or refractive surgery because those are the patients who are going if they are unhappy they are going to come back and nag you so and you don't know what is happening they don't know what is happening and everyone is going to have sleepless nights so I think uh, that's uh, in, especially this times when we can't avoid masks during the time we have vaccines uh, let's use uh, the sense of patients a happy outcome Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so um, just to summarize the whole thing, we started with uh, discussing a new idea uh, uh, about using uh, lubricating eye drops and being mindful about which lubricating eye drops that we're using on the ocular surface, which can have a multimodal effect rather than just um, causing dilution or covering the ocular surface or the cornea. Uh, we uh, graduated from uh, that to... Um, uh, Dr. Sharon beautifully explaining about uh, different cases and justifying a stepwise customized approach um, in each case. And uh, each case had small trivia and small points to take back home. Um, and uh, 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 further on, we, we had a wonderful uh, justification and validation given by Dr. Arvind, uh, who described beautifully in his, uh, with, with uh, hard evidence of... Um, the use of uh, trehalose uh, on the ocular surface and how it is having a wonderful effect on uh, our dry eye patients um, compared to other uh, lubricating eye drops. Further on, we had uh, uh, um, the right explanation for using, uh, uh, you know, the proper or be mindful about the use of uh, the lubricants on the ocular surface, especially for healthcare workers, uh, along with using it on our patients. And then we had a, a conclusion with hard hitting thinking mind uh, with each case, which was again, very, very customized um, and uh, a stepwise approach for treating uh, extreme cases of dry air disease. So starting from mild to moderate to having extreme cases of dry air disease. And I think it has covered the entire spectrum beautifully. Um, thank you very much uh, Delhi of Thalamic Society for giving us this opportunity. Uh, to do justice to this topic. And uh, thank you, Professor Rohit Shetty uh, and all the speakers uh, who contributed to this session. Uh, with that, thank I think you. This is session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arvind. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sir. So, so could you could just uh, pass on a concluding remark? <laughs> Dr. Rohit? No, I was, I was, I thought you were asked Dr. Arvind. I will ask Dr. Arvind to be there because he was there throughout. Dr. Arvind, would you like to give a I, I have done that, sir. I, I've given my comments. <laughs> okay, I think uh, otherwise it's, it's basically, we're talking here with no financial interest, but it's just a love of a product which is very cellular in its mechanism and not, uh, I saw what Natasha said, it's like a fracture. If you are just... Putting a lubricant drop is like putting mulam or uh, swelling with a fracture. If you add the fracture, you treat the fracture. I think that concept should be driven in our mind that instead of just any drop-based lubricant, fix it what really blocks what is actually the root cause. I think that is where this, is, this works. And uh, even though one company sponsored this, but it's not the only company which is doing so. People can use any company's drops, but... We have to smart think smarter and different in this new normal. Stay safe and uh, thank you all of you and wonderful talk, wonderful discussion. And all the uh, back uh, people from the back side also who have been uh, from DOS who really uh, taken care to make this happen. Thank you also. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.